We're going to be talking, obviously, about the, the King James Bible. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. Um, <clears throat> I have taught some of this stuff here before, and um, I had somebody say, well, you know, I saw this before, like, like change the history of the Bible because they heard it before. Uh, and I just tell them this, I say, you know, guys, I don't get tired of hearing about the Alamo. I don't get tired about hearing about the, the, the bridge at Concord. I don't get tired of hearing about Gettysburg, especially since we won. But, um, uh, and this is, it, it may be a refresher for you. It may be a help uh, to, um, uh, to, to encourage you. I key on this, and, and I will say this, uh, and there's, there's, no, um, uh, there's no arrogance, there's no pride in this statement. Uh, I tell guys all the time, you can disagree with me. That's no problem. You will not refute me. The answer book has, uh, it got, it was published in uh, 1989. It is on the desks of the, the, uh, the world's most, foremost anti-Bible people. Nothing in the answer book has been refuted because everything in the answer book comes back to the Bible. And we say so many things. You know, I, I tell guys, a, a conviction is not a line on a piece of paper with a yes and no box. And as long as you check the right box, you're okay. Do you believe in salvation by grace? Check. Do you believe uh, in eternal security? Check. Uh, I know you believe that, but you better believe what the sentence says, all right? And the statement we make time and time again, we, we beat our chest about it, is that the Bible is our final authority in all matters of faith and practice. That is what you believe, correct? And, and um, one of the things I point out, you know, if you, if you study, well, like what's going on in, uh, uh, in, in the... Uh, uh, Mideast now, or the you know, the Near East, whatever they call it. They're fighting by one set of rules. We're fighting by another set of rules. You cannot win. If your neighbor can throw rocks at your windows, if you don't ever start throwing rocks at his, he is never going to stop throwing rocks at yours. Uh, in Vietnam, if the North can invade the South and the South can't invade the North, tell me who's going to win. You have to you have to play by the same rules. Either nobody invades across the border, or everybody gets to. Uh, what you're seeing in Israel right now is that the Palestinians think, the, the Muslims think they're allowed to lob rockets at Israel. It's not fair that Israel would shoot back. But the only difference about, about that situation is Israel plays by the same rules as their adversary. And so if you talk to somebody that uses a new version or doesn't like the King James Bible, you can't agree on anything. Uh, they're not going to agree on Easter. They're not going to agree on the character of King James. Uh, they're not even going to agree... Uh, that there's a perfect Bible, okay? And so you've got to find something. And guys, here's what you have to do. And I do this to this day. I do this. If I'm going to talk with somebody that is uh, an adversary about the King James Bible, this is the first question you ask them. You ask them this. Do you accept the Bible as your final authority in all matters of faith and practice? I have yet to have one say yes. You know what they say? Of course. You know, it's like they're insulted. You know, like, well, you better believe it. Oh, I believe that which is great because that just sets the hook deeper. But if they say this, if you say, do you accept the Bible as your final authority in all matters of faith and practice? If they say no, then you're done. Go get a burger because you already proved your point. If they say yes, then you've got them. Because when somebody says this, here's what happens, you guys. You are intimidated by somebody's education. Maybe you haven't been to Bible college uh, and this guy has been to uh, four years, five years, six years. He's got some letters behind his name. Uh, and you think, oh, man, you know, how can I, uh, how can I you know, talk against him? How could I go, to, go head to head with him? Because he's so much more educated, not smarter, but more educated. And that may be true. But when a man says, the Bible is my final authority, you know what he just said? My education isn't. He has, he has put you and him on level ground. Guys, you believe that book? Then... You got him. And so uh, uh, the two verses I always point out uh, in uh, Matthew chapter 7, <clears throat> verse uh, 17 and 18. Even so every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree <coughs> bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Uh, I tell guys when I, when I moved to Auburn, New York and took the church there, uh, we had about two or three flowering crab apple trees. Have you ever seen a flowering crab apple tree in the spring? It is one of the most beautiful trees you ever saw. Beautiful pink uh, blossoms, but you don't want to eat the fruit. Those little crab apples, I mean, you'd rather eat marbles, okay? 
And you are never going to get a Jonathan Delicious apple off a flowering crab apple tree. You know why? Because it is a corrupt tree. And a corrupt tree cannot bring forth good fruit. And a good tree cannot bring forth. Look, you're not going to go to a Jonathan Delicious, delicious uh, apple tree and pick a, uh, a, a crab apple off of it. So a good tree brings forth good fruit. And, a, and an evil tree brings forth evil fruit. And that's it. And that is a Bible truth, correct? Then here's what we got to do. Uh, I tell guys, there's only two places that Bibles come from. Um, uh, you know, you hear people say this. They go, uh, well, you know, there's, uh, there's 200 Bibles out there. Or there's 300 Bibles out there. And one of the, point, the things I point out is there are not 200 Bibles. There's not 100 Bibles. There's not 50 Bibles, not 25, not 10. There aren't five different Bibles out there. There's not three different Bibles out there. But there's not one Bible. There's only two. You can go into a bookstore and there's 25 versions on the shelf, but they, are only rep they only represent one of two Bibles. And the only two places you're going to get a Bible from is you're going to get one from the, the Greek manuscripts from Antioch in Syria. And that's where you're... Oh, I, mess, I hate when this does this. Um, <clears throat> you're going to get one from Antioch in Syria... Uh, and that's where your King James Bible comes from. Or you can get, get one from Alexandria, Egypt. About everything out there is from Alexandria, Egypt. Now, the, the what, the uh, academia, uh, the guys that really aren't informed, uh, the guys that don't have the faith to believe God's got a perfect book, they believe that Alexandria is the best place to get uh, a Bible from. And they don't like the Texas Receptus. They don't like the Greek that comes out of Antioch. And let me tell you why. There's only one reason. Prejudice. They are prejudiced against Antioch. They will, they will skew the facts if they have to, whatever. We say Antioch is the place to get your Bible and that Alexandria is no good. Let me tell you why. Prejudice. <laughs> I mean, really, guys, some of you have never, you've never, ever uh, investigated this. You just took it, took it uh, for granted from somebody like me or somebody else that said Antioch's the place to get the Bible from. Okay, that's it. Alexandria is bad. Okay, Alexandria is bad. Guys, although you are correct in what you say, that is really not a good reason to take a stand. And what we need is a final authority. We need a final authority that tells us about Antioch, and we need a final authority that tells us about Alexandria. <coughs> and all we're going to do, now tomorrow and the next day, it'll be two hours. We'll take an hour break uh, or a break after an hour. But this goes all the way. So you're on the roller coaster. It's a two-hour ride, hour and a half, two-hour ride. Uh, and, um, and we're just going to, we're going to look at all of it. What we're going to do is we're going to investigate what the Bible says uh, about Alexandria uh, and about Antioch. Now, um, guys, all of us are capable of what I'm about to tell you. Have you ever heard anybody, uh, they, they wanted to teach a doctrine and they handpicked a verse and twisted it into their doctrine? And we say, well, that's crooked, but we're all prone to that because more than more than uh, being accurate or, or right, we want to win an argument. We are geared. You know, if there's anything sad about our society, we have come to the point where everybody has a minor in debate. And they will make a point. They will try to make one point. I got this guy that hates my guts. And I made this statement. I said that Jesus Christ is not our Messiah. He was sent to be Israel's Messiah. You can't find any place in the Old Testament where, where the, the Messiah was promised to Gentiles. So this guy says, okay, the Messiah is Christ. So Jesus, uh, uh, Sam Gipp denies that Jesus is Christ. And then he plays 20 seconds from this sermon that I said. And I'm thinking, you're telling me that a guy preaches for 43 years and you can listen to everything he says where he calls him Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ the Lord, Christ Jesus the Lord. And, and for 23, 43 years, uh, he proclaims Jesus is Christ. And somebody can, can get a 20-minute a, a blurb from a message and prove a point. But that's where we are, guys. We want to win a debate. We don't care about truth. We want to win a debate. We're looking for some way to score points. And, and again, that's one of those spirits that's in our country, which means you're going to have to resist that. You're going to have to step back from that. Um, uh, Robert Dick Wilson. Robert Dick Wilson uh, was uh, uh, David Osfuller's mentor. And uh, Robert Dick Wilson said this. I remember I reading this back about 1976, 1977, when I started uh, writing the Gone for the Master's degree, which uh, the master's thesis is the understandable history. And, and again, this is going to have to paraphrase. 
But Robert Dick Wilson was basically a TR man. Uh, we, we claim him because he, he helps us. <clears throat> but here's what he said. He said, you see, he believed that, the, that Antioch and the Texas Receptus was the place to go for manuscripts. But now he's going to investigate history. And he said, when you believe something and you begin to investigate it, and you guys, if you're honest, if you're honest, this has happened. If, it's never been afraid of, if you've never been afraid of an investigation, you've never carried out an investigation. And he said, when you begin your investigation, you're just a little bit apprehensive that you're going to find out that the facts don't prove your point, that you're wrong. Guys, who, would it be awful? You guys believe in salvation by grace, and then you start reading your Bible, and you found out that everybody that got saved got baptized to get saved? Now, you're not worried about that, right? Please tell me you're not worried about that. And he said, so you go into history with a little secret apprehension. You're not going to tell anybody, but a little apprehension that I'm going to find out, oh, no. I, I believe three things out of a total of 100, and 97 of them go against me, but my three, I've been making my point. I'm in trouble. But he says, then, as you, as you investigate, turn over the rocks, you might say, he said, you not only get your three points verified, but you find about a dozen more. And he said, you almost get exhilarated. He said, you come out not believing what you believed, but believing it even more for more reasons. All right? Uh, let me give you a thought, guys. Uh, some years ago, um, some, some preacher said that it was not the, the blood of Jesus Christ that paid for our sins. It was his death. All right, let me ask you this. Where did the concept that it was the blood of Jesus Christ that paid for our sins come from? Well, no. Where did it come from? The Bible. So, so if it's really the blood of Jesus Christ, I don't say you should throw away what you believe, but, but you would be safe to set what you believe aside and go to the Bible. Here's what I did. I, I believed it was a blood, never doubted it. But I said, I believe the blood because I was taught that all, all my Christian life. And everybody that taught me apparently got it from the Bible. So, so wouldn't it be safe to set it aside? And here's what I did. Every time I saw the word blood, like this guy said, I put in death. And you know there's places where it says the blood you can put in death? And there's places where it says, in, it says blood. It can't be anything but blood. And so my Bible, then I just picked back up what I'd set aside with more documentation. All right? Uh, when I was in Pensacola Bible Institute, uh, I believe the King James Bible. Uh, again, I came out of, the, I came out of the, the gate believing that. The church I got saved in uh, was a King James Bible church. Uh, Mel Sabaka that led me to Christ was a King James Bible believer. Pete Ruckman, where I was going to Bible college, uh, believed the King James Bible. And I said, God, I said, Mel Sabaka, the guy that led me to Christ, believed the King James Bible. And the guy that's teaching me Bible, Pete Ruckman, believes the King James Bible. And I said this to God. Those are the two worst reasons on the planet to believe the King James Bible. Now, you can take those two names out. Because if you say, well, I wouldn't believe it because of Ruckman. Well, put your guy in. Put somebody else in. And I said, if I'm going to believe it for those two reasons, I got, that is really poor. So I said, you know what I'm going to do? I am going to, I didn't start using an NIV. I didn't start using American Standard. But I set my, my King James Bible belief aside and began to study history. Guys, it's kind of like I threw them all in a ring and the King James Bible said, he grabbed the, the, the New American Standard and said, get out of here. And he grabbed the Living Bible and says, get out of here. And pretty soon, the only one standing in the ring was the King James Bible. So, so the, King James, the, the Bible, the Bible is our final authority in all matters of faith and practice. So we're going to study what our final authority says about Alexandria <clears throat> and about Antioch. And at that point, it doesn't matter what anybody thinks. It doesn't matter if you don't like what it says, okay? I want you to go with me, if you will, back to Genesis chapter 12. And as you go back to Genesis chapter 12, uh, I told you one of the things that we are all prone to do is to take a verse and twist it to say what we want it to say. Uh, I say this tongue-in-cheek. I say this jokingly. Um, I'll probably get ridiculed because I, like I'm teaching it like a doctrine. Uh, but I tell people that the greatest verse in the Bible is um, John chapter 11, verse 35, Jesus wept. You say, why? Because you can, you can teach anything from it. Uh, you know why Jesus wept? He wept because you people weren't tithing enough. And then you preach on tithing. Uh, he wept because someone was being critical of last week's message. And then you preach on that. Uh, Jesus wept 
because you're not bringing visitors to church. I love the verse because you can just, and that's why I tell people, I said the greatest verse is Jesus wept. I hate to say this. You have no idea how many times a preacher says, man, I got a great message. If I could just find a verse. <laughs> Jesus wept. Okay, that is the verse. And so um, there is a, a, you call it a law, call it a rule, whatever you want, but it was not initiated by, by uh, Bible believers, King James people. Uh, there is a standard teaching. Now, guys, I say this. You're allowed to question your standard teaching. You know, people ask me, um, what about this? And I have one of three answers. Here's what they taught me in Bible college, and they were right. Here's what they taught me in Bible college, and they were wrong. Here's what they taught me in Bible college, and I haven't studied it out myself. So I'll tell you what they taught me. And it is, I, I think you should be willing to look at what you believe critically and be willing to say that they're wrong. There's guys come out of Bible college believing Jesus was a Baptist, starting Baptist churches all over the Mideast. Okay, guys, you can believe that all you want as long as you don't go anywhere near the Bible. So if you believe that, then you should be willing that the Bible change you. There's guys come out of Bible college thinking that once you're saved, you ought to be baptized by immersion. Okay, you ought to be able to set that aside, go to the Bible, and come back believing that after you're saved, you should get baptized by immersion because that's what's in the book. Um, people ask me something about a church constitution, and I'll say, well, here's what I was taught, or, or some situation. I'll say, well, here's what I was taught, but I have never faced that myself. Here's what you need to be very wary, wary of. Because of our pride, we are not allowed to say, I don't know. And, and um, you're going to start making uh, authoritative statements about stuff that you've got no business. Uh, I had a guy, and I found, out, I found out one of his tactics is to send guys letters, ask them a question, and the whole idea of the letter was that he could get them to say something, and then he's going to go uh, and, and rail on them for it. And he may have been setting a trap for me, but he set the wrong trap. Uh, this happened probably about 20 years ago. Uh, and he wrote me and he said, what's the best Spanish Bible? And I gave him the answer. I give everybody on Spanish or French or German or whatever. I said, I don't speak Spanish. I am not qualified. Give me a Spanish Bible, okay? I can go to Acts chapter 8, and if, if verse 37, if it goes from it goes 35, 36, 38, 39, I can tell you if verse 37 is missing. But if verse 37 is there, that doesn't make it a good Bible. And you say, well, yeah, but you've got to speak authority. I don't have to speak authoritatively anywhere I'm not an authority. And I am not an authority on any foreign, uh, foreign language translation. And at that time, there were three big groups that were fighting with each other. Uh, all of them claimed to be King James Bible believers. Uh, and they all had a different, this is the Word of God in Spanish. In fact, that's about where it is now. There's uh, three different groups. And I said, brother, I said, I don't speak Spanish. I am not qualified to make any statement on the Spanish Bible. And I got the, the contact information for all three of these groups. I said, contact this guy, contact this guy, contact this guy. Listen to what their arguments are about each other, about their version, uh, their, what, whatever they're promoting. And I said, make your own call. And he never railed on me because I think he was trying to set me up. So, so there is a, a teaching. It's not one that we made up. And it's called the law of first mention. Guys that don't believe the King James Bible will still subscribe to the law of first mention. The law of first mention in the Bible is this. The first time something is mentioned pretty much sets the stage for how the Bible looks at it, okay? Example, a snake shows up the first time in Genesis 3, and it really never got much good press after that. Isn't that true? I tell guys, if you like snakes, you've got a problem, okay? If it's not a belt or a hat band, and so we're going to look at the first mention, not of Alexandria, but we're going to look at the first mention of Egypt, where Alexandria is. Uh, and the first time it happens uh, is this. Again, again, um, who was it? Well, what, Nancy Pelosi. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure they use her head for the strategic oil reserve because there's nothing in there. <laughs> and, and what did she say? Unemployment, more unemployment is good. Yeah, she said, they, they were telling her about, well, you know, you're a Democratic president. Uh, we've got more unemployment. And she said, well, that's... That's good because now people have more family time. Then why don't you go have more family time? All right? And what I'm saying is, see, you're, there's always a spin. 
There is always a way to twist the facts and make it look good. Just listen to any Democrat. And so, um, so here's what I tell people. Uh, look at uh, Genesis chapter 12. Uh, in Genesis chapter 12, there is a famine in the land, uh, and Abraham goes to Egypt. Look what it says in verse 10. And there was a famine in the land, uh, and Abraham went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. And it came to pass, when he came near to, to enter into Egypt, that he said unto Sarai his wife, Behold now, I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. Therefore, when it shall come to pass, I, I'm, I'm sorry, therefore it shall come to pass, when the Egyptians shall see thee, that they shall say, this is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will save thee alive. Now, I, I, don't know how, I don't know how your marriage is, okay? Being a man, I see this as a negative reference. There's probably a bunch of women right now looking at their husband going, could we go to Egypt for vacation? But, um, but here's what I tell guys. Just do this. You want to take your wife on a vacation. You go to a travel agent. And you say, hey, I want to take my wife to, to vacation, get away for a while. Tell me a good place. Guy says, Egypt. Take her to Egypt. Really? What's there? Uh, if you go there, they'll probably kill you and keep her. Could I send my mother-in-law? Um, you see what I'm saying? That is a negative connotation. That is the first time that Egypt appears in Scripture, and it is in a negative uh, uh, connotation. We won't go there. You can mark it down if you're writing notes, but in, in uh, Genesis chapter 37, uh, Joseph was sold into slavery in Egypt. Again, if you see that as positive, it's because you bought him. But uh, it is not a good thing. Um, take a look at Exodus chapter 1. Exodus chapter 1. And look at verse 11. Therefore, uh, talking about the Egyptians, they did set over them, the Jews, taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens. Uh, and they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Python and Ramses. All right, uh, um, Joseph went down into Egypt, and then, of course, then, then uh, Jacob, his father, and his family all followed him down into Egypt, and hundreds of years later, they ended up being slaves there, correct? Okay, I want to go on vacation. Tell me what it's like. Well, uh, if you go there, they'll probably kill you, they'll keep your wife, uh, and they'll turn your kids into slaves. Now, I, maybe what you've been watching on HBO makes that look attractive to you, and if it does, you're sick. Because that is not a positive connotation. Look at verse um, 15. And the king of Egypt spake to, to the Hebrew midwives, of the name of the one was Shifra, and the name of the other was Pua. And I always stop here to say this. If you want good biblical names for your children, those are two to ignore. Don't call your kids Shifra and Pooh. I don't know what goes through some people's heads. I really don't. Here's our twin girls, Bathsheba and Jezebel. <laughs> I'm, could you imagine some other going, Shifra, Pua, come home. You know, there's Ruth, there's Deborah, there's nice names in the Bible. And he said, verse 16, when you do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women uh, and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then ye shall kill him. But if it be a daughter then she shall live. So tell me again why I should go to Egypt for vacation. Well, if you go there, they'll probably kill you. They'll keep your wife. Uh, they'll turn your kids into slaves, and they'll kill all the boy babies, and they'll keep the girl ones alive. Guys, there is nothing positive about that. Now, remember I told you this earlier, and you have to suspect yourself. We're willing to suspect somebody else. Isn't that true? Um, it, whenever, whenever some politician does something and says something, we go, what is he really after? But don't think for a second that all the hypocrites are in Congress. It's in us. Uh, and so um, I'm willing to let somebody say this. Gip, uh, I, I'll tell you what had happened. So, oh, this is probably about 20 years ago, too. Uh, this guy writes me. He was a pastor in Washington State, I believe. Uh, and... and um, he said, he gave me a verse about Egypt in the Bible that was positive. And he said, when you teach about Egypt, you never show that verse. Because you don't want people to know that the Bible actually has a positive look at Egypt. Well, wait a second, guys. If there's a negative verse and there's a positive verse, who's to say who's right? Right? I mean, I could be just grabbing the negative ones uh, and, and making Egypt look bad when God looks at it good. And here's what I wrote him. And, and here's, here's my challenge. My challenge is take 
when you read your Bible, take a piece of uh, a legal pad and, and put Egypt at the top and write a, draw a line right down the center. And on the top of one side of that, one, you got two columns. Top of one column, put positive. Write the word positive. Top of the other column, write negative. And try this. Then every time you see the word Egypt in the Bible, if it is positive, put it in the positive column. If it's negative, put it in the negative column. And I told him that. I said, when you read your Bible, which probably, obviously, he was never going to do, so I, I didn't have to worry. But um, I said, I said, write down every positive reference about Egypt, every negative reference about Egypt. And I said, if the positive references, when you're done, outnumber the negative, write your letter to me again. I have never heard from him. That's either because he, he wasn't serious anyway. He was just grabbing a verse to, to, to try to refute me. Um, but if he did do what I told him, I know I never heard from him because time and again, they are negative. There's some that are neutral, but they are, they are predominantly negative. And so you could be sitting there. You should be. You should say, but how do I know that Gip isn't hand-picking the negative references about Egypt? To which I say this, my opinion isn't important, neither is yours, correct? Okay, what about God's opinion? God's opinion. You know, if there's a statement I just, uh, I mock, I think it's the stupidest thing people say, it sounds so cool. You ever hear everybody say this? One man in God is a majority. To which I always say, when did you ever think God needed a man to be a majority? What do you think? He's, he's serving in parliament? Oh, could somebody just agree with me? Because if I could just get one vote, I can be a majority. Guys, if all of the world votes against God, he wins. Isn't that right? So I say this, what if, forget about Gip, what if we could get God's opinion? And I, 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 you know, I'm not a good fisherman, but I can get people. And, and I said, what if we got the words coming out of the mouth of God? Would that satisfy you? Yeah. Okay. Take a look at Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20, now look what the first verse says, and God spake all these words saying, okay, it says God spake these words, it doesn't say Gip spoke these words, right? So we are now getting the words out of the mouth of God, look what God says. Uh, and God spake all these words saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. God's opinion of Egypt is it is a house of bondage. Now, if go to the vacation place, go to the travel agent. Why, why do I want to go to Egypt? Well, they'll kill you. They'll keep your wife. They'll enslave your children. They'll kill all the boy babies. Now, have you ever, you ever, uh, you ever gone to a travel agent or seen, you know, you see these beautiful posters. I think they're the funniest thing. I mean, it shows this, it tells you about an island. And it shows this beautiful beach. It shows this beautiful blue water. And it's about 50 feet of beach. What you don't know, that is the only 50 feet of beach in that country that looks that way. And right behind it is a landfill. On the other side is a minefield from an old war. And on this side is a junkyard. And they don't let anybody on that beach because it's there for promotions. And, 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 and here's what it says. Paradise. Here's how the one for Egypt would be. House of bondage. Now, unless you're from San Francisco, that should not interest you, okay? Um, take a look with me, with me, if you will, at Jeremiah chapter 11. Jeremiah chapter 11. <coughs> look what it says in verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, okay? Who's doing the talking? God. All right. What does he say? Um, verse 4. Which I commanded your fathers in the day that I brought them forth from the land of Egypt from the iron furnace. Can you see the picture? Ah, oh, let's go to the iron furnace. Let's go to the house of bondage where they'll kill me, keep my wife, enslave my kids and kill all the boy babies and keep the girls alive. Guys, I am telling you, the Bible's view of Egypt is always negative. Now, let me ask you a question. I don't know if I'm going to get away with this or not because 
we have, we have become so gun shy uh, or so pious. Who was the wisest man that is spoken of in the Bible? Solomon. Okay. I, I used to ask that. And then there's always, you ever, you, ever, you ever meet somebody that just wants to show you that they're closer to God than you are? And I was in this church. And I said, who was the wisest man that ever lived? And the whole church went, Solomon. And that is the answer. And this guy waited until the whole church said that. Then he went, Jesus. You know, I just want to show you, you, you picked a sinner. I picked Jesus. Okay, guys. Okay, so I do I have to frame it? The, the wisest man born a sinner. Then I ask this question. Okay, you guys, you guys, Solomon's the wisest man that ever lived. Let me ask you this question. Is there anybody here, and I mean this, that you would say, I, I am his equal. I am wiser than Solomon. Anybody here wiser than Solomon? Anybody, I, I'm at least on par with him? Okay, I ask that question next. I said, is there anybody here wiser than Solomon? And of course, the whole church went, no. And this guy waited until they were done. He went, I am because I trusted Jesus. And we sent him to Jesus right after the service. <laughs> so, so the wisest man that ever lived was Solomon, correct? Now, I want you to pack that away. Set that aside. Keep that in mind because we're going to visit it again. Uh, in fact, if I should forget, I want you to draw me back. But, but look at Deuteronomy chapter 17. Now, I am talking to a group of people who are... Uh, who believe Solomon is the wisest man that ever lived and do not believe they are wiser than him or his equal, correct? Here's personally what I think. Uh, in fact, you really want to know what I think? I think the wisest man ever born is Daniel. As far as men, I think he's the wisest man ever born. Because the Bible, remember, talks about the wisdom of Daniel. There's a place where it talks about the wisdom of Daniel. You say, well, then how come Solomon's the wisest? I think Solomon got his wisdom bestowed upon him by God. I think Daniel had it naturally. But uh, in uh, Deuteronomy chapter uh, 17, you have Israel. They're not even in the land yet. And you know what God does? God sets up some rules. And here's what he says in verse 14. When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and shall possess thee, I say, sorry, shall possess it, uh, and shall dwell therein, and shall say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are about me. So he said, when you guys get into the land that I'm going to send you to, and you guys say, we want a king like all the other countries, you understand that a, that a monarchy is not God's method. It's not his form of government. Neither is a democracy. Neither is parliamentary government. Neither is a, a uh, representative republic like we have. It's a theocracy. God's method is some guy riding a mule, and he's called a judge. That was God's method. But he said, you're going to get into the land, and then you're going to want a king like everybody else. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to set up the rules for your king. Verse 15. Thou shalt in any wise set him over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose. One from among thy brethren thou shalt set king over thee. Thou mayest not set a Kenyan over thee. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, that, the Hebrew word for stranger is Kenyan. Anyway, um, which is not thy brother. Now watch this. But he shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to the end that he should multiply horses. For as, as, for as much as the Lord uh, hath said unto you, ye shall henceforth return no more that way. So look here, guys. Here you got the nation of Israel. And he said, when you guys are a nation and you say you want a king, he said he's got to be a Jew. And when you get a king, I don't even want him to go to Egypt for a horse. Now, I told you we're going to the Bible as our final authority. I told you we go to that. That's what we do, correct? All right, what I'm going to give you now is not Scripture. You can throw it out. I call it GIF logic. GIF logic is, makes sense to me, okay? Uh, if, uh, if smoke began to fill this room, GIF logic says, let's go watch it from the parking lot, okay? That just You can disagree with me, and we will contact your next of kin. Here is GIF logic, and you don't have to agree with this, but here's how I think. If you shouldn't go here for a horse, you tell me, what's more, more important, a horse or a Bible? Then if you shouldn't go here for a horse, why would you go there for a Bible? You know, if you've got a used car dealer in this area and he is known for being crooked, 
I mean, he beats everybody out of money. He's selling people with bad tires, bad transmissions, bad engines, and does not back them up. Uh, and you say, man, I, and he's a saved guy, of course. Um, uh, and you say, man, I wouldn't buy a car from that. Don't ever buy a car from that guy. Would you then go to him and say, now, you know, I'm wondering about the, uh, the modern translations of the King James. Would you ask that guy? If you wouldn't trust him w to buy a car, right. would you go to him about the Bible? Just a thought. You don't have to agree with that. Just logic. Now, have you ever heard anybody say this? That guy is good for nothing. Uh, there's a joke. The joke is that this guy was a drunk. He was a drunk. I mean, his wife had left him. His children were ashamed of him. His health was broken. He couldn't keep a job. He's laying in a ditch like he always is. And some guy comes by and goes, man, your life, your life is a total waste. And he says, no, my life isn't a total waste. I can always be used as a bad example. <laughs> right? You know there's something good. You say, well, there's nothing good about Egypt. Oh, yes, there is. Go to, go to Revelation chapter 11. And Egypt has a value. You say, how could such a destitute place have a value? Do you remember uh, 1990 when Saddam Hussein with Iraq uh, invaded Kuwait? And do you know who they compared him to? Does anybody remember? They compared him to Adolf Hitler. If you study history... It was, it, was, it was Europe in the Middle East. Here's Germany. They invaded Austria. They annexed it, and they're going to make it part of a greater Germany. Hussein, that's what Hitler done. Hussein, uh, he invaded Kuwait, which was right next to it. Uh, he was going to annex it and make it part of a greater Iraq. So it was the same thing, and people compared Hussein. Now, you'd say, well, Hitler's not good for anything. No, he's always good for a bad example. Isn't that right? In fact, uh, to this day, if the news media wants to bash white people, they call them Nazis. Did any of you ever see the uh, movie Clear and Present Danger? If, did, any of you, now, uh, did any of you ever read the book? Um, or no, no, it wasn't Clear and Present Danger. I'm sorry, that's not it. It was Some of All Fears. It's a Tom T Clancy novel, uh, and they set off a nuclear weapon at a Super Bowl or something like that in this country. And in the book, the guys that get, it's a, it's a, they get a nuclear bomb and they set it off at a Super Bowl. And in the book, the guys are Muslims. And in the movie, they're Nazis. They're white, good old boy, Bubba, militia Nazis. Because they didn't want bad press for the Muslims and they love to badmouth. And whenever they want to badmouth, you're just a Nazi. Okay, so Hitler's still good for a bad example. What you got here uh, in uh, Revelation chapter 11, you are in the tribulation. You have the two witnesses, Moses and Elijah, <clears throat> and, uh, and they get killed. And they get killed here in Jerusalem. God wants to say something bad about Jerusalem. Look at verse 8, Revelation chapter 11 and verse 8. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of that great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. So you say, boy, Egypt isn't good for anything. No, it can always be used as a bad example. <laughs> that is the only value. Guys, is Sodom a good, uh, the city of Sodom, is that a good exa example? Would you want Plainville to be compared to Sodom? You would not. Please tell me you would not, okay? You don't even want to compare it to San Francisco. So, so in the Bible, Egypt is, is negative. That is the way the Bible looks at it. Now, Alexandria itself only appears four times in Scripture. We're going to look at that. Uh, I want you to go with me, if you will, to Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. I'll give you a thought, okay? Get, go answer this to yourself. If somebody came up to you and said this, what chapter in the Bible proves to you that God loves you? If you had to go to one chapter of the Bible to show everybody how much God loved you? Would it be like John 3, because 3.16 is there? Uh, would it be Matthew, or, or, or would it be um, Romans 5, because it says, uh, verse 8 and 9, but God committed his love toward us, and while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Uh, would it be, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, Ephesians, because they're in uh, chapter 2, because for by grace you saved through faith, not knowledge of yourselves. What chapter? If you had to tell somebody, this is the chapter that convinces me that God loves me, 
Just pigeonhole one. You're not going to be wrong. We're just going to come back to that also. All right. Uh, in Acts chapter 6. In Acts chapter 6, you have the first mention of Alexandria. Now, you know the story. You have uh, what are known as the, the first deacons elected here. Uh, Stephen is one of those guys. Look at verse 8. And Stephen, full of faith and of power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then uh, there arose a certain, uh, certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines and Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. Now, you guys know what the end of the story is here? These guys disputing with Stephen win the argument with rocks. <laughs> They kill him. So the first people to, the, the first martyr of the church was Stephen, and some of the guys that were pitching the rocks were from Alexandria. All right? Could I, I know this may not mean anything to you, but if you're ever in a third world country and they pick up rocks, run. Yeah, who throws rocks here? Right? I mean, because you see look at you. That is not how it is. Uh, I knew a, a fellow who was a businessman. He had about uh, he was uh, uh, he had a lumber business and he was having a dispute with a village and he'd drive through this village to get back to his uh, sawmill uh, and the villagers he's got five of his guys in the back of the truck uh, and they uh, or one of them was inside four of them in the back and they you know they're standing with rocks we're not going to let you go by unless you give us money and he said well, I'm not giving you money he's a he's a he's a Japheth nobody tells him and he drove on through they start to and they threw rocks at his truck. Now, can you imagine? You know what you see? You see these little kids throwing rocks at a truck. Oh, no, no. You have to understand, in third world countries, you know what they hunt with? Rocks. So when they throw a rock, I'm talking about a grown man. When he throws a rock, it's probably going to hit what he's aiming at. They started pelting his truck with rocks. They hit one of his men in the head. The guy fell off the back. They ran up to him with, uh, with bush knives, machetes, and cut him up, killed him. They, uh, they were stoned him. Uh, the, the other four guys uh, took off running. They got this guy, they are, they are beating him to death with rocks, just throwing rocks at him. And you know what saved his life? Some Pentecostal missionary had been through that village many years ago, and there was a little Pentecostal church, and this pastor runs out and stands between that dying, he was, an, uh, he was a Kiwi, he was a New Zealander, between that dying Kiwi and this crowd and says, in the name of Jesus Christ, I tell you to stop. And they turned and walked away. There's some power in that name. And he gathered that bleeding New Zealander up, carried him off to a person's house. Uh, they, they, the police finally came later and took him away. And the only reason I'm telling you that is because when, if you're ever in a situation and you go, oh, look, they're picking up rocks. Who's afraid of that? Here, nobody. Any place else, you are in serious trouble. Uh, I heard of some guys, uh, they had guns. And they faced some Muslims with slings, like what the Palestinians were using. And they got off about four shots, and then they died. So, so <clears throat> don't, uh, you know, don't, don't, well, they threw rocks. In, in other countries, that's a big deal. So, Alexandria uh, is a source of, of some of the murders of the first martyr of the church. Depending on your opinion of the church, that's good or bad. Since I'm in it, I see it as bad. The second time that uh, Alexander is mentioned, look at chapter 18. Acts chapter 18. <coughs> In Acts chapter 18, look what it says, verse 24. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, and an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures came to Ephesus. Now, before I go any farther, let me explain something. Apollos the man we just were introduced to, is not saved. Well, sure, it says he's mighty in the Scripture. Hold it. Being mighty in the Scripture makes you saved? I, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand on this, but you ever have a Jehovah Witness knock on your door and tied you in knots because he knew more about his Bible than you did, although he knew it wrong? Or a Mormon because he knew more about his Bible than you did? Church of God, I'm not talking about First Church of God down on the corner. I'm talking about the body of Jesus Christ. Which is why, keep this in mind, uh, this is another bad thing. you got some folks, either they're from Jewish ancestry or they're from Gentiles who've been hit in the head too many times. And they're trying to get back into Judaism. You get these uh, Jewish ministries 
uh, you know, we're about Masonic Jews, and they're all dancing around a loaf of bread going, hi, yay, 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 and they're all doing this Jewish stuff and keeping the Passover. Why would you do what, God, what, what the Apostle Paul, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said, knock it off. You're not a Jew anymore. So this man is introduced as a Jew. If he's a Jew, he is not part of the church of God. But another reason is because he is, look what he's teaching for the gospel. Verse 25, this man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the Spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only, knowing only the baptism of John. Um, years and years and years ago, I can still see it. I'm a little kid. We're riding with the family through the country, and I see a bunch of people in a, in a crick in white sheets. And I realize now that was a bunch of believers and somebody was getting baptized. That's what they were doing. They were baptizing. And that was back in the 50s, okay? If you saw John the Baptist baptizing and you saw your pastor baptizing, would it not look the same? Now, I don't know if John dunked them backwards like we do or put them three times forward or put them straight down, but whatever, John put them underwater, Correct? So if you saw, let's just say John did it just like, all right, here's John the Baptist. He takes a guy. You, I mean, you're, you're viewing it. You're on the highway. You're seeing him down there. You hear what he's saying. And, and John goes, plunk. And you see your pastor. And he goes, plunk. And you go, that's the same baptism. No, it's not. You're, we, we baptize people because they have trusted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Correct? Uh, did John baptize Jesus? Come on, it's not a trick question. Well, did he baptize Jesus because Jesus had just trusted Jesus Christ as his personal Savior? <laughs> no. You know, I tell people John was, and this really is true. You know, we have, uh, we have everything to publicize, publicize things. Uh, we have TV. We have radio. We have uh, newspaper. You've got the bulletin board at Walmart. You've got the Internet. You know, I go to meetings, have people come in and say, I saw your schedule on the Internet. But, but in the old days... Uh, you go back in this country 150 years, and, and maybe, maybe even farther than that, I'm trying to get, let's say we go beyond electricity, the, the days of the Old West, and let's say the circus is going to come to town. What happens when the circus pulls in and nobody knows they're showing up? So you know what they did? Uh, about a month ahead, maybe two weeks ahead, they sent a guy literally with a drum. And he walked in. Now, now think about it. I'm talking about where, where there is just nothing outstanding about life. And suddenly one morning, there's a guy standing on the corner going, boom, 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 boom. When not you go, hey, let's go find out why the guy's beating the drum. Now he's got a crowd, and he stops beating the drum and goes, uh, you guys probably wonder why I'm beating the drum? Yeah. Well, I'm just here to tell you, in two weeks, the circus is going to be here. And everybody goes home and goes, hey, two weeks from now, the circus, let's get ready. The circus is coming to town. That guy was the front man for the circus. What if Jesus Christ showed up, but nobody went ahead of him? So John went out through Judea like this. Boom, 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 boom. And for six months, he beat a drum. You know what he said? He's coming, he's coming, he's coming. They said, what are you beating this drum about? Listen, he was so successful that when they came, they didn't ask him where's the Messiah. What did they say? Are, are you him? Are you him? <laughs> no, 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 guys, I'm not him. I'm just a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. John, in John chapter 1, verse 31, said, I, I am come baptizing with water to manifest Christ to Israel. Let me ask you this. If somebody was not saved and, and we took them up in that baptistry and baptized them to, for the repentance of sins uh, to manifest Christ to Israel, would they go to heaven? No, they would not, because that water's not magic. Isn't that true? So, guys, the second time Alexandria appears, it, it is associated with bad Bible doctrine. Now, this is one of the most precious things, and I, I don't use that word often, but when I think of precious, here's the verse. This is uh, this of the King James Bible. It's not just of truth, but the way the King James Bible is worded is so tremendous. Look at verse 26. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them 
and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. Man, I love that phrase. Uh, maybe it's because I'm an author. I just love that. And they expounded on him the way of God more perfectly. You say, what does that mean? They led him to Christ. They said, hey, man, you're a great preacher. You are really eloquent. You've got some Bible knowledge. Yeah, well, thank you very much. There's only one problem. What? Uh, you're going to hell and you got the wrong message. What? Yeah, let me, let's explain. He goes, well, man, I got to get saved. And you say, oh, Gip, how do you know that? Because watch what happens afterwards. And when he was disposed to pass into Icaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. Question, just based on logic. This is based on logic. Logic does not overrule scripture. But, but if, a, all right, let me ask you this. If a man was going around preaching the, the baptism of John the Baptist, would your pastor write a letter of recommendation for him? Would, would Brother Brandon do it? I wouldn't. Ed wouldn't. You wouldn't recommend somebody who's out teaching bad doctrine. And they know he's been teaching bad doctrine. But they're recommending him. Why? Look what it says. Exhorting the brethren to receive him, who, when he was come, helped them much, which had believed through grace. That's not the message he was preaching. For he mightily convinced the Jews. He was introduced as a Jew. Now he is convincing the Jews. And what is he convincing them? That they should get baptized according to the baptism of John? Mm-mm. And that publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. His whole message changed. You say, why? It always helps a preacher's ministry when he gets saved. Okay? Uh, there's an evangelist out there. I think he's about 1,000 years old. I heard him preach in 1971 by the name of Carl Woodbury. He's got a track out. It's called Lost Preacher Saved. He was a Southern Baptist preacher. Uh, and, he, and he came down to Pensacola and preached a revival and talked about how he preached for like 15 years. As a, but eventually he ends up in Rome. And, and he was there a couple of years, and then they cut off his head. Word is that after they cut off his head, he didn't preach much. You can laugh there. Um, let me ask you something. If you were thinking about committing some sin that would put you out, do you think the devil might send the taxes? Well, Paul has got to get to Rome. You, Paul was... was he was as much a problem to the devil after he got saved as he was to God before he got saved, all right? Uh, and so, um, so watch what happens. He gets arrested, and then it says this in verse 20, uh, chapter 27, <coughs> verse uh, 5. And when we had sailed over the sea of uh, Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia, and there the centurion found a ship of Alexandria, sailing into Italy, and he put us therein. So the Apostle Paul is put on a ship to go to, to, to go to Rome, and it's from Alexandria. Now, I don't mind if you say this, Gip, that's a stretch. I mean, you're going you're gonna to condemn Alexandria because Paul is put on a ship from Alexandria to go to Rome? No, I am not. What happens to that ship? Yeah, it's shipwrecked. Think, guys, these are not trick questions, <laughs> okay? That ship is shipwrecked. He spends three and a half months on the island of Malta. It's called Melita in the Bible. But take a look at chapter 28. And after three and a half months, or three months, it says this in verse 11. And after three months, we departed in the ship of Alexandria. Now, I'm saying it's, it's bad because both ships from Alexandria. Guys, there were a lot of maritime countries around here that those ships... That, don't you think one of them could have not been from Alexandria? Alexandria? So the first time Alexandria uh, is mentioned in Scripture, it is mentioned with the people that killed the first martyr of the church. The second time, it is bad Bible doctrine. And the third and fourth time, the ships that took Paul to Rome and his death were from Alexandria. Now, let me tell you what else there was in Alexandria. There was a school, call it a Bible Institute, Bible College, whatever you want to call it, uh, there was a school, and it was run by a guy by the name of Philo. Philo, I, I say it this way, Philo was a semi-converted philosopher. So what do you mean semi-converted? That means he went to hell. That's what it means. Uh, he never gave up Jewish practices. Uh, he, Philo was truly a scholar. Let me, let me, let me clue you in. Uh, you know, I write. And in this area, in this vein, when you write a book, there are two audiences that you can address. 
You can address one at the expense of the other or address this one at the expense of this one. You can address academia or you can address the common man. Now, the Lord always went to the common man, correct? The devil is not afraid of a Bible in a, in a, in a college library. He's not afraid of a Bible chained to the, to the uh, table in a church. He's afraid of you having the Bible. But here's the problem. If you address academia, here's what you get. Oh, from academia. Oh, Dr. Gipp. Oh, your treatise on the second aorist tense of the Greek there in 2 Corinthians 4 was just, it was just so illuminating. And they all sit around rooms and, and go, oh, the gazoo And you know what you guys do? Well, what did you think when I said your treatise on the, on the Greek of the second aorist tense of the Greek of, of uh, 1 Corinthians 4? Did that like make you want to go out and read your Bible and win souls? No, it leaves you behind. But if we address you, you get something, go do something for God, and academia hates you. And that's why uh, there's a guy out there by the name of, uh, I don't want you to say his name, but Donald Waite, and he's a TR man, he's not a Bible believer. And he's very academic, and he hates my guts. You say, why? Because when I write, I won't address him. He wrote a book against Bible, Bible correctors uh, and said more bad stuff about me than he did them while he was using my material and claiming it. <laughs> anyway, so, um, so this guy was a philosopher. Uh, Philo, um, he was a semi-converted philosopher. He interpreted the Bible philosophically and allegorically. He did not believe that there was a man in history named Moses. He did not believe there was a man in history named David. Do you believe that? Do you believe there was a real Moses? Do you believe the Bible should be looked at as an allegory that the, the, the six days of creation weren't really six days, it was just an allegory? Or do you believe it was six days? Okay. If Philo were alive today, and he's not, but many of his ancestors are still here, his philosophical ancestors are still here, your pastor would not let him come and preach in this church. Um, he, he looked at the Bible philosophically and allegorically. Uh, he corrupted pure Bible manuscripts. You know what he didn't believe? He didn't believe in a trinity. And he's here. So what do you think a guy who doesn't believe the Bible is infallible and doesn't believe in a trinity, and he gets a Bible manuscript from up here, and it says uh, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. You know what he does? He writes him his own Bible manuscript, and he deletes that verse. Now, We've been talking about getting Bible manuscripts, <clears throat> corrupt Bible manuscripts from, from uh, Alexandria, but it is only one of two things we get from Alexandria. The first thing you get is an Alexandrian mentality. Now, I am a believer in this. I am a believer that, that, that truth is simple. Um, I, I, had a, I had a student many years ago back in the 70s, uh, and he went on to be in a, uh, in a church, and we're, I'm, I'm preaching for him back in 87. And, uh, and he knows I write and stuff, and so he wants to be a writer. And he said, I wrote something on prayer. We're having dinner. I, I wrote something on prayer. Would you read it and tell me what you think of it? And that last sentence is always the danger. And I said, yes, I will. So I took it back. And here's how he equated prayer. He looked at prayer, uh, a view I'd never seen before. He looked at prayer like exercise. Okay? Now, if you're not exercising, you're not going to start by running 10 miles. If you can run 10 miles, you're not going to get up in the morning and run 10 miles. What do you do? You, you stretch, right? And you warm up, correct? And he said, he said, people make an error in just jumping into prayer, and he, and he said, you got to do this and this and this and this to warm up for prayer. So we had breakfast. And he said, what would you think? And I said, well, till I read this, I thought I knew how to pray. And then I asked him this question. Let me ask you this question. I said, what's easier than talking to your father? Hey, Pop. Right? Now, I don't say we should address God that way. But where you might be afraid to address a stranger or somebody in authority, your dad shouldn't be like that. Isn't that true? I said, what is, I said, there's nothing in the, in the Christian life, there is nothing easier than talking to our Father. 
And I said, you took the very simplest thing in Christianity and made it difficult. I said, he is no friend who takes the simple and makes it difficult. That's what we have government for. I said, if you want to be a friend of people, take the difficult and make it simple. I am dedicated to that, guys. That's why, no matter how big it is, the understandable history of the Bible is an understandable history of the Bible. Man, I read stuff, guys. I read stuff that thick. I read stuff that's a century old and two volumes, and it is like running through waist-deep mud, and I have to look at that. Then I try to, I try to put, if I do get something, I put it out where you don't have to run through waist-deep mud to get it. And so um, here is the Bible mentality, or the, the Alexandrian mentality. I'll put it very simply, and this is what it is. The Bible is not perfect and can be improved on, okay? So I got room for this. Here's what the Alexandrians say. The Bible is not perfect and can be improved on. You say, how does that work? Have you ever heard a guy preach? And he said this. Now, the Greek word translated here, that the, that the translator translated this way, a better translation is this. Yeah. Have you heard that? That's what he just did, didn't he? Didn't he just say, that book's not perfect and can be improved on, right? So the key here is that the Bible is not perfect and it can be improved on. Do you believe that? No, you do not. Would your pastor let this guy in his pulpit? Not to clean it. He wouldn't let the guy run the sweeper in this sanctuary. Isn't that right? All right. So, uh, I just like that. See that better. Anyway, so um, uh, that is, <clears throat> that is uh, Alexandria and the Bible. Now, um, when you are in this, people will refute you or try to refute you. Uh, one of the very first ones, I told you that the answer book came out in 1989. I was refuted for my very first time in 1990. Now I have to tell you something. Academia will not address me. And here's why. They get thumped, and then I'm going to tell you about it. I'm going to say, hey, uh, the big shot, uh, he wrote to me, and, and I gave him this answer, he never wrote back. So what they always do is they always have a marionette. And the, the student, the zealot, writes to me. And in 1990, I got a letter from a young guy because this uh, professor in Finland uh, refuted what I had said in the answer book about this right here. And here is what he said. He said, you notice Dr. Gipp talked about what was wrong with Egypt. Well, I did, did I not? And he said, uh, and then he talked about Alexandria, and then he talked about Antioch, but he never talked about Syria. Remember the first mention of Egypt was negative, and the first mention of Alexander was, was negative, correct? But he said, Dr. Gipp never gave the first mention of Syria because the first mention of Syria is also negative, and he wanted to hide that. Now, guys, if I've done that, am I honest? No, I am not. And, and here's the danger. Listen, guys, never go out on thin ice. Never, never say, the, the less you know, the more you are prone to make these grandiose statements. Uh, uh, Joe, uh, Joe Karen texted me some time ago, uh, and I get this question a lot uh, about um, uh, the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in the first birth, purified seven times, thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. And everybody likes to speculate on what those seven times are. You know why? Because they, they don't know what it is. And why, you know, it's better to make something, you know, shoot some fireworks off uh, from uh, Psalm 12, 6 than to study. And, and here's what I've heard. I never speculate. You say, what are those seven times? I don't know. I do not know. I do not categorically say, here's the seven times. Here's what I've heard. I've heard uh, there were, the Bible translated, was translated into six different languages before the King James, and the English was the seventh language. Well, that's really good, isn't it? You say, then why won't you say that? Because sure as I preach that, right after church, some guy will say, oh, look here, here's another language you didn't mention. That would make English eight. I have heard this. 
um, the, the King James Bible was translated in 1611. You know that there are not revisions of the King James, but there were different editions of the King James. That is a major difference. And that the one we use now, the 1769, is the seventh edition. You say, well, why don't you say that? Because sure as I say that, some guy's going to come in and say, these two are the same one, there's only six, or here's another one, and now there's eight. Or they say, um, there were, uh, there were um, six translations into English, and the King James is the seventh. I don't proofread for anybody. Uh, I have my proofread, pretty, proofreading done by three different individuals and still get typos. Um, but I don't have time. I get people, they send me manuscripts. I said, don't send me a manuscript. Um, the guy sent me a 400-page manuscript. I looked behind my chair one day in the motorhome. It had been there for five years. You say, don't you feel bad about that? No, I told him not to send it. I can't. But there was a fellow from out of the country, and he wrote a book, and he asked me, I preached for him, and he said, would you, would you proof this? I said, yeah. And he subscribes to the theory that there were six English translations prior to the King James, and that the King James is the seventh. Doesn't that, I mean, won't that, doesn't that look really impressive? And in this list of seven pre, six pre-King James Bibles, and then the seventh one was King James, he had Gutenberg 1456. Now, you're sitting there, you don't understand. Gutenberg, his Bible, was Latin. <laughs> it wasn't in English. It doesn't belong in the list. So now what's wrong? Now he's only got six, right? So I said, I wrote to him uh, when, I, when I proofed it. Uh, I always, I, always uh, I, I comment in red because I want it to be horrible. Um, and so I scratched out Gutenberg. I said, brother, Gutenberg was Latin. You can't put that in a list of English Bibles. But I said, now you only have six. So I said, add this one or this one, and then you'll have seven. Because there were two other English ones that he didn't have in there. And so I said, if you want seven, put this one in or this one. Now, what I'm hoping is, you go, well, okay, because if I put it both of those eight, uh. But that's where it is, guys. And so here's what this guy did. Uh, he gave this reference that I had, uh, had hid. First off, I didn't hide this. I will tell you the real truth. I wasn't aware. The reason I, the reason I said that, though, here's the reason I said that. If you, if you make a stretch, if you stretch on accuracy or you shoot for the, um, in, in, in lieu of real study, pyrotechnics impresses people. But when you do that and then somebody shows it was just a flash, it taints all of your data. I know a, a King James advocate, apologist, uh, fellow, friend, and uh, one particular quote that wasn't even about the King James Bible, they made. And they plucked a quote and applied it to their book. And when that was exposed, here's the problem. Now, you say, well, if, they would, if they're intellectually dishonest here, then how do you know they're honest in every other area? So don't say something that, that you just, well, this will show him, this will bully him, this will shut him up. Not if it's not accurate. And so if I hid, and I did not hide, I, I'll be honest, I was not aware of the verse that this guy showed. But if I did, if I was aware and hid it, not only am I dishonest, but now you have to say, well, look, we found out Gip did hide one. How do we know he's not hiding something else? And it taints all of your data. All right? And this is the, this is the verse that the guy gave. Go to Judges chapter uh, 10. Now, I like to be refuted because, um, because it spurs me on. Uh, every now and then, you know, you, you get a bunch of stuff and I'll say, God, uh, have me be refuted on something so that I can double check. I don't always want to stay stagnant. I don't always want to uh, stay, with the, uh, stay with the same pool of facts. I want to add to them. Right. And so usually being refuted, uh, you know, spurs me to something. This is what this guy gave. Judges chapter 10. And he said this in verse 6. Uh, and the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam and Ashtaroth and the gods of Syria and the gods of Zidon and the gods of Moab and the gods of the children of Ammon and the gods of the Philistines and forsook the Lord and served him not. Now, i got news for you. If that was said about the Democrats, even the news media would have a hard time putting a positive spin on it, right? Is that, all right, is Syria mentioned there? Is it negative or positive? It's horribly negative. 
right? You can't even pretend that is positive. You can't put a positive spin. It is so absolutely negative that you're stuck. But let me, let me warn you. Here's another thing you need to be careful of. Uh, I say this. The electronic age has hurt our churches in two different ways. It's hurt our women in one way. It's hurt our men in another. Um, soundtracks and, and inexpensive uh, sound systems have made a bunch of women who cannot sing think they can. These women get up and they got this orchestra behind them and then they get up and they, they sound like somebody just parked their car on the tail of a cat. But they hear the artist and you're crying because it's horrible. And they go, look, they're crying. Not why you think. (laughs) Here's where it's hurt our men. Men, computers and Bible programs have made a bunch of lazy men think they're Bible scholars. Because you can punch a word into your computer, tell it to search a Bible program, and then go mow your grass. And when you come back, you got 45 pages that your printer threw up on your desk. I had a guy come up. He was going to impress me. He brought a stack of papers. It was a half an inch thick. And he hands it. Remember I told you only a man can do something stupid and finish it with, huh? And this guy handed goes, here you are, brother. Uh. I said, uh, what is this? That is the word forever, every time it appears in the Bible. I'd just been wringing my hands about how many times the word forever appeared in the Bible. The only good thing about this was I thought about how many trees they had to cut down to make the paper. That was the only positive thing here. I pitched it. This guy thinks he's a Bible scholar. He's not a Bible scholar. He's lazy. And I can pick that up. And here's your danger, guys. If you're going to punch a word in, you know what you're going to do? You're going to get every verse with that word and miss every verse about that subject that doesn't have that word in it. And when when I read that in Judges, I said, somebody... Just looked at a Franklin. You know Franklin, before they had uh, computers and everything, the Franklin little electronic concordance? Hey, they're great. I used to carry one with me. I have I've have more than once been sitting on the front pew. I am 60 seconds from getting up there, and I need a reference, and I punch the word into the Franklin, and I found my reference. But I don't do my Bible study. I have a Bible program on my computer. You know what I use it for? Uh, if I write a book and I need a, a, a I, I cut and paste from my Bible into my book. Why rewrite the Bible? But I don't do my Bible study with it. And, and I thought, I don't think this is right. Something here is not right. I think this guy punched, here's what he did, and he did. This guy in Finland punched Syria into a Franklin, and that's the verse he came up with because that's the first time the word Syria appears in the Bible. Now you still think I'm refuted. All right, I got, a, I got a deep biblical question. This is not a trap, okay? In your Bible, which comes first, the book of Judges or the book of Genesis? That's a tough one. Come on, Genesis. Okay. I want you to go back to Genesis chapter 24. So we are now way before Judges, are we not? And, and I'm going to show you something here, and then I'm going to show you something that is alluded to that is just out of this world. Uh, here is uh, Abraham, and he wants a, a, a bride for his son, Isaac. Now, there are some things, again, this is not a, this is not a King James Bible believer rule, this is not a Sam Gipp rule. You guys know about typology. Uh, is Abraham, especially in this passage, Here's what you have. You have Abraham who wants a, a bride for his son and he sends his servant. And it is typology. It is the Trinity. It is Abraham, the father, who sends uh, Eliezer, the servant, the Holy Spirit, to go get a Gentile bride for his son, Jesus, Isaac. Okay? It is a beautiful typology. And look what he says in verse 4. He gives, uh, he gives Eliezer this instruction. But thou shalt go unto my country. What country is that? You don't know. It's not stated there. And to my kindred, and take a wife unto my son Isaac. Now, let me tell you what's wrong with the Franklin. What's wrong with the Franklin? Oh, it's not really wrong. It's what this guy did. He punched in Syria. 
and he came up with, with, the, with the verse in Judges. But if he had done this, if he had spelled out Syria and then put an asterisk, here's what the Franklin would have done. It would have taken him to every verse with Syria, Syrian, and Syrians. In other words, it would have, he would have seen everything that, that had any kind of a reference to Syria. And he might, have, he might have ended up a little bit ahead. Maybe even did. For all I know, maybe he did, and the facts didn't prove his point, so he just was deceitful. They are, they are known to do that. Uh, look at um, Genesis chapter 25. He goes and gets the bride. Look at verse 19. And these are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham begat Isaac. And Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife, the daughter of Bethuel the... What's the next word? Where do, where do those come from? Where do Americans come from? Uh, where, do, where do Chinese come from? So where do you reckon Syrians come from? And if he went back to his country and the guy got the, daughter, got the bride from was a Syrian, what country do you reckon they're in? Isaac was 40 years old when he, when he took Rebekah to wife, the daughter of Bethuel the Syrian, and of, of Padan Aram, the sister of Laban the Syrian. Guys, that is the first time there is any reference to Syria, and it is nothing but positive, is it not? Because Syria, Syria is where you got the Gentile bride for the type of Jesus Christ. Isn't that right? But there's something even better than that. Uh, look at... Um, Look at Genesis 24 again, and verse 4. Thou shalt go into my country. All right, then, what is that country? Uh, judging from what we just saw, where, that, that he got, he got Rebekah from Laban, the brother uh, Syrian, uh, and from uh, Bethuel, the Syrian. Where did Eliezer go? To Syria. Guys, this is not rocket science, Okay. I, I think sometimes you're so scared that we're going to trick you into giving an answer. I know preachers do that. They, they trick people into answering wrong, and then they jump on them. I will not do that to you. I will give you the right answer and jump on you anyway. But um, so, so that means that when he said go to my country, he's talking about going to Syria, correct? Now go back to Genesis chapter 12. And do you remember what appeared the first time in Genesis chapter 12, verses 10, 11, and 12? First reference to Egypt. And it was negative, correct? But now look at verse 1. Now the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of, what's it say? Thy country? Somebody want to tell me what country that is? Syria. So though Syria is not mentioned by name, we know it is alluded to in chapter 12, correct? And come on, guys, it's nothing but positive. Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and I will make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. It's all positive, correct? So the first allusion to Syria is positive, and it's a mere coincidence, I am sure, that that it appears in the same chapter that Egypt appears for the first time in the negative. Now, you remember I asked you, uh, if somebody asked you, what, what chapter in the Bible proves to you that God loves you more than any other chapter? And I don't know what you'd pick. Like I said, you might pick Ephesians 2, Romans 5. Uh, you might like Psalm 23 for all I know. You might John 3 because 16 is there. My chapter, if anything convinces me that God loves me, it is Acts chapter 6. I want you to go back to Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. Now, guys, honest, I have, I've been doing this for 40, over 40 years. And it is not always pleasant. Um, you know, I told you about flying, I think I told you about flying over to London and looking at some manuscripts. And, 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 and I, I say this, you know, this subject um, I like the academic, and I, I enjoy uh, investigating this stuff, but there's some of it is, it's like sucking in talcum powder. I mean, it is dry, brother. It is dry. And, and I, I say this, do you know what is more boring 
than a British author. Now, I love the Brits. But, pip, pip, tut, tut, let's have a war. I mean, what is more boring? A, a Brit, a, an Englishman can put you to sleep reporting on a house fire. I say, so and so. Give the microphone to an American. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, it's horrible. The flames are leaping 50 feet into the air. Women are fainting. Children are crying. I mean, we will make a movie, right? Do you know what is more boring than a British author? A century-old British author. I can't tell you how many Brits I've read. Uh, the Life and Letters of Westcott. It was over 100 years old when I read it. The Life and Letters of Hort, 100 years old. Uh, re well, not recently, some time ago, uh, I had a two-volume set, a thousand pages, written in 1871. It was so dry. And I was the first person to read this copy of the book. I can prove no one read this book before me. When I got it, the pages are yellowed. They are, I mean, it's a century-old book, and no one had read it. You know how I know? If you know anything about printing, they take a big sheet, and they'll print like, like eight pages on that sheet, and then they fold it and fold it, and then they bind it, and then they, the, the pages will be, they'll be stuck together. They cut this off. That's how the pages are open. And, and when they cut this one, the cut missed some of those. And I go to turn a page, and it still was wrapped around to the next page. I had to take my pocket knife, and this was the only joy I had with this book, cutting it with a pocket knife. I'm hacking the pages apart. And this guy, he had paragraphs that were four and a half pages long. I think you should go to jail for having paragraphs four and a half pages long. And so, <coughs> <coughs> I've been studying this for over, for, for over 40 years. I have read um, hundreds of books. Uh, I've got some books that you will never have your hands on. There was a book called Milestones in the Great, Hi Great Highway. Uh, it was written in the 1800s, I believe. There were only 250 copies printed. I got a copy. You ever, you ever see how sometimes the first, first letter of a chapter is like a drop capital and it's very ornate? When this guy had his book printed, 250 copies, every first word in every chapter had no first letter. In other words, the word the, it started out lowercase h-e with a big blank spot. And then this guy on 250 books in every chapter with color calligraphy did his own first drop cap. Every letter is different on every copy. And you're not going to get that book. And I, I think I'm talking to people that you don't really, you're not really interested in reading 100 books over 40 years to, to get this stuff, right? Come on. All right. Let me ask you this. Would you be willing to read just 50 books and uh, 20 years? You're not looking really excited. Uh, how about 25 books in 10 years? Okay, how about we cut this back to five books in a year? You're still not. Have you seen our coloring book? Anyway, um, would you be willing to read one book? Now, I think some of you are saying this. Uh, yeah, I, I might read one book, right? You don't have to. You don't have to spend 40 years. Are you ready for this? What if I told you you could nail down whether Antioch or Alexandria, whether the King James Bible, all the modern translations are the best? Which one's which? And you didn't have to read 100 books, 50 books, 25 books, 10 books, 5 books, not even one book. Are you ready? You don't even have to read a complete chapter of a book. Now are we in your sandbox? All right. What if I told you, you don't ha even have to read 10 whole verses of a book, of a chapter. Look at, um, look at Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. I told you, I don't believe there was a uh, First Baptist Church of Jerusalem, and I don't think all those apostles were Baptists, but, but this one almost makes me think it was because they were murmuring, disputing. You know, I was listening to Brother Beach talk about the Adam last night, and I talk about that Adam and that how Adams are. I tell people, I said, everything in the world is Baptist. 
These chairs are Baptist. This carpet's Baptist. This building is Baptist. Those fans are Baptist. The grass is Baptist. The dirt is Baptist. The, your car is Baptist. The Pope's car is Baptist. The Pope's clothes are Baptist. The Muslim swords that they cut people's heads off with are Baptist swords. My proof is that every atom electronically, magnetically, is made to come apart. It is made to split. Now, if that's not Baptist doctrine, nothing is. Right? And you say, well, why didn't it split? Because by him all things consist. And exactly what Brother Beach said is right. He didn't have to do anything to you. Just keep quit thinking about you, and you go. So, here's this Baptist church. Maybe it was. In those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report. Question, if, if, so, if you never met a guy and you said, what's that guy like? And somebody said, he is honest report. Is that negative or positive? Yeah, I mean, unless you're recruiting him for Congress or the, the uh, Obama cabinet, that's positive. Okay, of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost. Is that positive or negative? Guys, you know what you're looking at? You are looking at the pre-Timothy chapter 3 um, uh, regulations for a deacon. Timothy hasn't told us anything about children being in subjection or not giving them much wine or anything like that. Timothy hasn't, or, or Paul. Paul hasn't written to Timothy yet. These are the only parameters we have for the early deacons. What were they? Honest report, full of the Holy Ghost, and of wisdom. Man, I, if a church is looking for a pastor and that's all they had about him, that's pretty good. Whom we may appoint over this business, but we will give ourselves to, to prayer, uh, continually to prayer, and the ministry of the word. Uh, and the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, full of man, uh, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Procurus, and Icanor, and Timon, and Parmenes, and Nicholas, a proselyte of where? Isn't that a coincidence? A man who is described by Scripture as of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, came from where? You say coincidence. Coincidence? How many guys are mentioned by name? Seven. And how many of their hometowns were mentioned? One. Antioch. And you can't say that's anything but positive, correct? Now, you want to know how much God loves you? If you really hear, if you really accept the Bible as your final authority in all matters of faith and practice, then you would go to Acts chapter 6 and you would read to verse 5 and you would say, look at that. The first deacon, a man full of Holy Ghost, uh, of honest report, full of Holy Ghost and wisdom, came from Antioch. Now go five verses down, or four verses down to verse 9, and in the same chapter, Alexandria is mentioned. Antioch and Alexandria are mentioned for their first time in the same chapter, inside the first nine verses, and the first mention of Antioch is positive, and the first mention of Alexandria is negative, and if you really accepted the Bible as your final authority in all matters of faith and practice. Somebody would say, I got a Bible, I got two Bibles here. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, well, this one comes from Antioch, and this one comes from Alexandria. Which one do you want? Yeah, I don't know anything about either one of those places. I don't know anything about them. But I read nine verses in my final authority, and Antioch was good, and Alexandria was bad. I, I think I'll take Antioch. Guys, do you know how much God loves you? You don't have to read the Brits. Trust me, he loves you. <laughs> you don't have to go to London to the British Library. You don't have to look at that stuff. You don't have to look. Listen, you say, did you read any of those Greek manuscripts? I had, I, I had Greek in Bible college. No, I didn't read any of those Greek manuscripts because you can't read them. If you know Greek, you can't read them, okay? You say, why? Because they're all handwritten and there are no spaces between any of the words. You'd have trouble if we did that with English. Isn't that true? So God loves you so much that the first, com uh, the first mention of Antioch is a positive mention, just like the first mention of the Syria. Syria is positive. All right? Now, I want to show you something. I'm going to prophesy for you. You know what you're going to do? You're going to do what God wants you to do. Now, wasn't that easy? Oh, let me finish the statement. You're going to do what God wants you to do maybe after you bury a kid. 
Maybe after your house burns down. Maybe after the car wreck. You say, what do you mean? Well, let me show you something. Look at Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, we're going to see a very unique thing that happens in the Bible that we are going to be part of sometime. And also you're going to see one of the craziest questions. There are just some questions in the Bible just are not fair. Here's the scene. The scene is they're on the top of the Mount of Olives. It is the resurrected Jesus Christ and the 11, the 11 apostles. And it says this in verse 8. Uh, he's talking, he's giving them, I call this last minute instructions. Uh, but ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall res, uh, be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and in the uttermost part of the earth. Guys, here's what I, I point out. This is God's four steps to world missions. He said, you should go to Jerusalem. You say, how do I spell Jerusalem? P-L-A-I-N-V-I-L-L-E, Jerusalem. That's how you spell Jerusalem. You should go to your locality. So uh, the first step, he said, he said, you go to Jerusalem. He said, then you go to Judea. Then you go to Samaria. Then you go everywhere else to the uttermost part of the earth. Correct? Uh, I was in Texas. Uh, in this church, and everybody displays their missions in a different way, and, and I like to look at mission displays just to see how they do it, and this one had the most unique. They had four maps. They had a map of their town, and over top of it, it said, Our Jerusalem. That's accurate. Then they had a map of Texas, and it said, Our Judea, because, because their town was in there. Then they had a map of the entire United States, which was smaller than the map of Texas, but you have to understand Texas. Then it said, our Samaria. And then it had a world map, and it said, uttermost part of the earth. That's exactly, that is the four-step process. So the Lord says to, this, these, to these guys, I want you to go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the earth. Now, this is a sidebar, but you just need to see this. Um, did you ever stop and think about this? We know about the Last Supper, correct? Did you ever stop and think that when they're having the Last Supper, Nobody knew it was the Last Supper but Jesus. You really think at the beginning of that supper, Jesus said, okay, guys, this is the big one. Eat up. We'll never be doing this again. I'll be arrested tonight and crucified by tomorrow. Let me ask you this. Do you think that the apostles had had many suppers with the Lord? Yeah. This was just one more. All right, let me ask you this. Were we in church yesterday? Do you think that's the last time you'll ever be here on Sunday? Do you think yesterday is the last time you'll ever be in this church on a Sunday? No, you don't. But what if something happens between now and next Sunday and these doors are locked up and you don't come in here? In other words, you never know when it's the last one. The Lord knew it was the last one. They did not. Well, he didn't say this. Guys, uh, <clears throat> I'm going uh, to be lifting off here in about five minutes. Let me tell you this before I leave. Okay, I'm done. Five, four, three, two, one. No. No. He's talking to him. Look at verse 9. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. You know, you've heard me say this. You know, I tell people to read their Bible all the time. And I tell you, sometimes when you read your Bible, get out of your chair, get out of your room, get out of your house, get out of the time in which you live, and enter. Here's what I'd like you to do sometime. Sometime, I want you to, you don't have to be one of the 11, but just, come on, you ever watch TV? Okay, have you ever been like something's going on over there and we're just viewing through the eye of the camera? View the Lord talking to these 11 apostles. And he says what he says, I want you to go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the innermost part of the earth. And they're going, uh, uh, Jerusalem, gotcha, gotcha. Uh, Judea, mm -hmm, Samaria, innermost part, gotcha, gotcha. And it, it gets done and suddenly starts to float off the face of the earth. What if you were talking to somebody or they were talking to you and when they got done, they floated away? You think you'd remember that date? <laughs> I mean, I can see this. He says, um, and here they are. They're going, uh -huh. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. Yeah, yeah, we got that guy, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? What would you do? You'd stand there with your jaw on the ground. In fact, that's why I told you one of the craziest questions in the Bible. Look at the next verse. And while they looked steadfast,
steadfastly. You know what steadfast means? They stood there fastened. They're, they are stunned. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? Oh, come on! I mean, why, why are you guys looking at heaven? You know what I think they did? I think they watched him go. They watched him go in the cloud. Now, do you think this happened? When he went into the cloud, they went, okay, guys, he's gone. Let's go get a burger. I go fishing. You know what I think? I think they watched that cloud for a long time. So they're staring. And these two guys are, hey, what are you guys staring at? What? Did you see that? Hey, hey, I, I, I spent three and a half years with him. I've seen him, I've seen him heal the sick. I've seen him raise the dead. I've seen him walk on water. I've never seen him fly. Could I give you another sidebar? Uh, you believe something wrong about the rapture. You, you believe something incorrectly. Do you not believe that the rapture happened right now? We're going to just poof, disappear. And where did you get that? You got that from 2 Corinthians where it says we'll be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Correct? Isn't this the beginning of our rapture? This is the first fruits. Did, did the Lord, was he standing there and just disappeared? Or did they watch him go? Guys, I think they're going to watch us go. I think we're going to be changed in a moment of twinkling of an eye. And then some guy who didn't get saved is going to go, Hey, you just, you, you don't look the same. You, hey, 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 I want to believe now. I want to believe. Guys, I think we're going to go up just like that. I think they're going to watch us go. I don't think we're going to disappear and, and suddenly be in the clouds. You say what you want. That's the only example we have of the rapture. That's how it happened. That's free. All right, so that's Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Have you ever heard this? Well, I believe the King James Bible, but we all know the chapter and verse markings were added later, and they're not inspired. Okay, okay. Well, I'm going to show you something. If it's not inspiration, it will do until inspiration comes along. We just looked at Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Let's reverse that and go to Acts chapter 8 and verse 1. And the sad thing about what the Lord told the apostles, go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the earth. There's only one sad thing. They never did it. The very 11 guys that were told that never did it because business was good in Jerusalem. Look what it says. You've got the, in chapter 7, you've got the martyrdom of Stephen, and Paul is standing there holding the coats while they kill Stephen. Now look at verse 1. And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great, uh, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at number 1, Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. Isn't that the exact order the Lord told them to go in? So he said, I want you guys to go. And when they did, you know what he said? I'll make you go. In fact, the only sad thing about that verse is the last three words. Look what it says. Except the apostles. Read it this way. Except the 11 guys that were told to do this. But is there something missing here? Uttermost part of the earth. The fourth step is missing, correct? Guys, I am a stickler on trying to be honest. I really am. I am a stickler uh, on not plucking a verse and putting it where it doesn't belong. And I wanted to show you this to show you the next reference. Uh, go to Acts chapter 11. You say, how can I go three chapters away and still be in the context of Acts chapter 8? Well, let's see. Let's see if we can do it. Verse 19. Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen. Guys, does that sound like Acts chapter 8 verse 1? Absolutely. Here's what you've got to remember. Those guys in that verse have been running for three chapters. They've been running since Acts chapter 8. Uh, persecution that rose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenice and Cyprus and Antioch. So down here you have Alexandria and you saw what was there. But now we're looking at Antioch. All right. So they went to Antioch and watch what happens. Preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only, because the New Testament church thought it was all going to be Jewish. So they only went to Jews. We were the dogs. We were on the outside. 
but the Jews didn't want to hear it. And so you know what? I, I always say this, guys. Our salvation is part of a divine plan B. He came down here to be accepted by his people. They rejected him. And you know what he Have you heard this said? Oh, did you hear about so-and-so? He went to the dogs. That's not a bad thing, you bunch of dogs. Because <laughs> that's what we are. And, and they said, well, hey, Paul, we're not going to listen to you. Us Jews aren't going to listen to you. We're, he said, well, I'll go to the dogs. Aren't you glad? I, I, I am not, I take it back, I am, I am not glad that, that the Jews rejected Jesus, but I am sure thankful that we got in on something because we got in on something. Verse 20, And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Guys, now mark what I'm about to say down because you're going to think I'm wrong. The first time Gentiles got saved in mass, I don't mean in a Catholic mass, I mean en mass, in a large number. The first time that Gentiles got saved in mass in public preaching happened here. It happened at Antioch. Now, you should be saying, well, what about Cornelius in Acts 10? He was a Gentile. Absolutely right. A couple of things about that. Number one, that wasn't public preaching. Wasn't that Cornelius' house? I'll give you a challenge. Go back to Acts chapter 10. You're there. You're right there. And you hear that Peter and some guys come from Jerusalem, and they're talking about Jesus, and just go up to Cornelius' house, open the door and walk in and see what happens to you. That's a, you think you can walk into somebody's house? That was private, guys. That was to Cornelius and his household. It was not public preaching. Secondly, these guys don't know about Cornelius. They've been running since Acts chapter 8. Now, I'm going to raise my hand to this. This is not a trick, okay? How many of you, like me, now some of you got led to Christ by a parent, by a teacher, by somebody in the military, whatever the case may be. And some of you went to a church like I did, and when the invitation was given, you got saved after the preaching. How many of you, like I, got saved in a church after preaching? This is the first time it happened, guys. We are connected to that because that's the first time it happened. Isn't it nice to know still gone on? It is still gone on. But watch what happens. And tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem. Uh, and they sent forth Barnabas that he would go as far as Antioch. All right, let me, uh, let me explain something. Let me tell you what Barnabas was. Do you know when a man becomes a problem to a pastor? Two times. There's only two things that makes a man a problem to his pastor. When he becomes more spiritual than his pastor, or when he thinks he's become more spiritual than his pastor. Example, you get a church where the pastor doesn't believe the book, or doesn't get in his book, and he doesn't read the Bible. If this guy, if the pastor's never reading the Bible, and you got a guy in his church that's reading every day, well, this guy's only going to run out of so many sermon texts on, you know, Jesus wept because you're not tithing, Jesus wept because you're not soul winning, Jesus wept because you disagreed with me. And one day, this guy's going to go, Preacher, I, I was looking at that text that you preached at, uh, Otto, that, that's, that wasn't the context. That wasn't, you, you, you twisted that. Touch not God's anointed. <laughs> you know what's wrong? The guy passed his spirit, pastor spiritually. That's why it is essential for us preachers to be in this book even more than you. Or when he thinks he's more spiritual. You know, people are pastor. I love him. But, you know, he, he thinks we're going to get away from the tribulation. But, but I was looking on the Internet, and I found out that we're going halfway through the tribulation. And so we need to gather. Or that's, and that's how they do it. Okay? So it's, you, are, you, are, you, are, you become more spiritual, or you think you are more spiritual. So here's what you got. Look at Acts chapter 9. Let me ask you a question. Uh, uh, what's his name? What's his name? Harry Reid. Harry Reid, if this guy, I mean, I, I don't know, he ought to be driving a 1923 Ford in Chicago machine gunning people. If this guy's not a cheap gangster, I don't know what is. What if next Sunday, this coming Sunday, you come to church and sitting right up there next to your pastor is Harry Reid? And your pastor comes to the pulpit and says, guys, I have Harry Reid today here. Uh, I think he's a good Christian man, and I want him to talk to you. Suddenly, you'd all be more spiritual than your pastor. <laughs> right? I, what would you do if that happened? You go, preacher, what are you doing? Right? But what if this happened? What if today, when we're done here, you go back home, you, you hit Fox News, and it says, 
Fox News alert. Harry Reid, Senator Harry Reid gets religion. Because they wouldn't say he got saved, right? Harry Reid gets religion. Then you watch the story. Story is, uh, one of his aides, one of the guys that works for him, you find out came from a little Baptist church in Arizona uh, and led Harry Reid to trust Christ as his personal Savior. Uh, here's what you'd say. Well, that's good, but we'll see. You know, I came into a church some years ago, and somebody said, did you hear about Jane Fonda? I said, she died. And they said, no, she got saved. I said, who did that? I said, next thing you know, they're going to get Roseanne Barr, and I'm not going. Anyway, you, here's what you'd say. You'd say, well, we'll see if he got saved. And sure enough, then you hear this. Harry Reid gets baptized by immersion and joins a little Bible Baptist church in Alexandria, Virginia. That's, I'm sorry, guys, that's the place. Um, and then you hear this. Harry Reid, the, the, and they, you, know, you ever see him standing on the floor of the Senate? You know, saying, here's why we should have communism or whatever he's saying. And you say, guys, I just want to let you know that uh, for years I was wrong and that you need to trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior or you're going to hell. Then you hear Harry Reid out, out on the streets of Washington, D.C., passing little gospel leaflets and going knocking on doors trying to win people to Jesus. And that goes on for three years. And three years later, you come in here, and he's sitting up here next to your pastor, and your pastor introduces him and says, uh, Guys, this is Harry Reid. I think he's a good Christian man. I want him to talk to him. You go, and I want to hear what he's got to say. That three years would prove something, wouldn't it? Yes, sir. You know, the toughest guy in the church was the Apostle Paul. Now, he was killing him. And on the road to Damascus, he gets saved. And you know what everybody in Jerusalem said? Yeah, we'll see about that. And guys, he did not go to the desert for three years. Everybody said, he went to Saudi Arabia for three years. There's nothing in the Bible that says he went to Saudi Arabia for three years. Look at Galatians uh, chapter 1, not now, some other time. It says he went down into Arabia, then back to Damascus, then after three years. So he's right up here. He's right up here in Damascus. It, and, and what goes on in Damascus is not lost on, what, on the people in Jerusalem. They know what's going on up there. And he's preaching the gospel so much that they're going to kill him. So they let him out of the, they let him over the wall in a basket. And you know what he says? Well, I'll go back to these guys. They'll be glad to have me. Verse 26. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples. He thought, man, they'll be glad, I, they'll be glad I got saved. They'll be glad, I get to be with some guys that agree with me. But they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. I believe you remember in Acts chapter 9 when Paul gets saved on the road to Damascus? I believe if he'd have turned right around and gone back to Jerusalem, they would not have accepted him, and they'd have said, we don't know that he's really saved, and isn't that rightfully so? But he's proved himself for three years up here, and now they don't believe? But this is the guys that never did do what they were told to do. They never did get anything straight. But Barnabas, verse 27, took him and brought him to the apostles, and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way, and that he had spoken to them, and how he had preached boldly in Damascus, and in the name of Jesus. So can you see it? Barnabas comes in. You know what Barnabas did? He comes into the apostles, guys. These are the guys that were at the Last Supper. Barnabas wasn't at the Last Supper. Who's this guy think he is? And he comes in and says, what are you guys doing? What are you? This guy has been up in Damascus preaching for three years. They're trying to kill him up there. He's been doing what you guys were supposed to be doing. And so he leaves. Can you see the 11 of them after he goes out and they're going, well, guys, you know, Barnabas did give us the land for the church. <laughs> and so what does it say next? And Paul, and he was with them going in and uh, coming in and going out at Jerusalem. And he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed him against the Grecians, but they went about to slay him. And watch this, which when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarsus. Man, the apostles got him out of Dodge fast, didn't they? But they still got Mr. Spiritual, the guy that's more spiritual than them, Barnabas. So now go to chapter 11. And you know what they hear down here in Jerusalem? They hear that up in Antioch, Gentiles have believed. And they're sitting around going, oh, no, Gentiles? Hey, guys, one of us is going to have to go up there. Who, who wants to go up to, to Antioch? to that Gentile city? 
Who was Peter, how about you? Hey, guys, at least I went out of town. I went down to Joppa. I did my thing. James, why don't you go? Well, I would, guys, but I've got to be killed the next chapter. So you know what they said? Let's send Mr. Spiritual. They sent Barnabas. They got rid of their problem. It's called the Peter Principle. They promoted him out of Jerusalem. Let's send him to Antioch. We won't hear from him again. Best decision they ever made. Verse 23, whom, when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all, that with purpose of heart they would cleave in him, for he was a good man. Okay, you know that is a general description that we preachers use. Maybe you, you, know, maybe you guys talk about each other that way. But it's like this. Um, your pastor, Brother Brandon, whatever. Uh, if, if, if I mention Brad Brandon to somebody and they go, I, I've never heard of him. I go, he's a good man. I do say that about him. Say anything else. But I say he's a good man. I mean, that's kind of, and somebody says to Brad Brandon, uh, who is Sam Gipp? And he says, oh, man, he's uh, uh, debonair, smart, wise, good looking, very talented. Um, but really, but really, good man is kind of a general recommendation we, we give to, about somebody that people haven't met, right? That doesn't mean he's a good man, but that's what we say. Look at verse 24. For he was a good man. Who inspired those words? Luke wrote them. Who inspired them? Come on, guys. The Holy Ghost. Can I tell you something? When the Holy Ghost calls you a good man, you are a good man. Amen. Boy, wouldn't you like somebody say to God, who is Joe Karen? God says, you let him alone. He's a good man. Amen. When the Lord thinks that of you, you're doing okay. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, and much people was added unto the Lord. Where? In Antioch. How many? By the end of the first century, there were over 100,000 Christians in Antioch. Guys, I am telling you that the New Testament church was not centered in Jerusalem. It was centered there. Look what happens. Uh, hey, when your church grows, you get an assistant pastor. So what did he do? Then Barnabas, uh, then departed Barnabas uh, to Tarshish for to seek Saul. He says, man, i got to get an assistant. Well, he ain't going to Jerusalem. Those guys, haven't, they haven't done anything right. And he says, I remember that crazy kid. That crazy kid, man, they like killed him in Damascus. They like to kill him in Jerusalem. But he's got some zeal. And he goes to Tarshish. And I've always said this. I always have a feeling that it probably didn't take him long to find Saul. He probably got about two blocks into just past the city limits. And he heard somebody going, the Bible says, and there's that crazy kid on the street corner. And he says, hey, kid, come back with me. Where did he take him? To Jerusalem? No. 26. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled it to, uh, themselves with the church uh, and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Guys, if a, if a person says, um, I'm a Russian. They kind of draw a spiritual, uh, they, they try, drive a spiritual stake in Moscow, right? Because that's the capital of Russia, right? Uh, if a guy says, uh, I'm a Mexican, he drives a spiritual stake in Arizona. But um, in, in Mexico City, uh, if a guy says, I'm a German, he drives a spiritual stake in Berlin. If he says, I'm Japanese, he drives a spiritual stake in Tokyo. If we ask, I'm an American, we drive a spiritual stake in Washington, D.C. I would love to drive a stake in Washington, D.C. When we say we're a Christian, do you know where we drive the stake? Where we got the name. Antioch. You know what's amazing? You say, preacher, preacher, you mean there are people that call themselves Christian? Now, now guys, you're not Christian because you're saved. I know we loosely say that, but the fact is that you're not a Christian when you're saved. When you're saved, you're on your way to heaven. It's the disciples, the ones, the, the ones who were saved that, that served the Lord that were called Christians. But, but when you say you're a Christian, you drive a stake here. But isn't this amazing? You say, well, preacher, how could people claim to be a Christian and say that King James Bible is, has mistakes in it? Well, you tell me. How can a person say I'm an American and burn that flag? But they can do it, can't they? So they can say they're a Christian and burn that book. But guys, this is where we got our name. We got it from Antioch. You know what happens to churches when God leaves? I say it this way, gold braid. So what do you mean? 
um, you know, I get a lot of churches, and, and I get to these churches, and they, they build a sanctuary too big, or, the, or they fit it at one time, and, and then it dwindles. I got saved in a church of 5,000 people. That church is now down to 1,000. Now, wouldn't you like to have 1,000? But if you were 5,000, that's one-fifth of what you are. And you come into those churches, and you know what happens? The last six rows have gold braid on them, so nobody sits there because they're trying to get the crowd to the front. And, and the church begins to dwindle, and then it needs help. This is the church that began to dwindle, and it needed help. But watch, watch the thing dwindle. Verse 27, And in these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch. So you know what happens? Now, prophets. Don't, doesn't God speak to prophets? I mean, if anybody ought to know the will of God, ought to be a prophet. And you know what these guys said? Hey, guys, get your U-Haul truck and meet me in Antioch. And so the prophets abandoned Jerusalem and went to Antioch. And then the church falls on hard times, the one in Jerusalem. And so, you know, you start taking turkey baskets and everything else to them and watch what happens in verse 29. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea. Now, by the end of that chapter, the whole transition has been made. Antioch is the, is the center of the New Testament church. And the church at Antioch is sending turkey baskets to the church in Jerusalem. You want to see God's sense of humor? Look at the next verse and see who he sent them by. which also they did, and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul, the two most unwelcome individuals in Jerusalem. Can you imagine what it must have been like for the apostles when, when Mr. Spirituality himself, Barnabas, and that crazy nut kid shows up, and they're saying, hey guys, uh, we brought you a check from our church in Antioch. We heard you're having a hard time. <laughs> yeah, we always liked you guys. <laughs> so God changed the location of the New Testament church to Antioch. You say, how do you know? Okay, you remember, uh, you remember some years ago, uh, the Marines had a, 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 a recruitment poster. And there's nothing, I mean, guys in military uniform look good, but you've got to say something about that Marine uniform. That's why our president wanted to put a bus driver cap on him. But um, anyway, uh, they had this picture of this guy in, in Marine dress uniform, and it said this, the Marines are looking for a few good men. Remember that? Do you know what that meant? And it's not, a, it's not a slap at the Marines, and it's not a joke. They're looking for a few good men because they don't know where they are. Right? So they're looking for them. Let me ask you a question. If God was looking for a few good men, you think he'd know where to find them? Well, you know what he's looking for? He's looking for some men to open a chapter in the history of the church that not only is not closed yet, but this church is part of. You know what it is? World Missions. Oh, guys, when, when you get involved in world missions, you get in something that God established back in Acts chapter 13, and he needs somebody to carry this message. Look where he goes. Acts chapter 13, verse 1. Now, there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas, and Simeon, which is called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manion, uh, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. You know where he did that? The first mission journey departed not from Jerusalem, but it departed from Antioch. You say, well, why didn't the Lord go check Jerusalem? He did. You remember Acts 1.8? You remember Acts 8.1? He gave them two chances. You know what he said? I'll just leave you behind, and I'll go up here. And so the first mission journey left from Antioch, and it returned to Antioch. And the second missionary journey left from Antioch and returned to Antioch. Jerusalem is out of the picture. If there was a First Baptist Church of Jerusalem, it's as dead as the First Baptist Church of, of Plainville. And I'm sure if you got one, it is dead. Now, a couple of things. First off, I told you there was a, uh, there was a school in... Um, uh, in uh, Alexandria, there was also a school in Antioch. Uh, it was run by a, by a guy by the name of Lucian. No pun intended, but I love Lucian. <laughs> I really do. This guy had it. 
Here's what Lucian was. Uh, see if I, 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 I failed to get my notes on this, the, on, on uh, Philo and Lucian, so I have to give you what's on the top of my head, and you can see there's not much on the top of my head. Uh, Lucian took the Bible. In fact, Lucian taught the Bible by this, they called it by the tradition of John, John, John uh, the Apostle, meaning this. He, he took the Bible. He believed the Bible should be taken literally. If it said there's a hell that's fire, then there's a hell that's fire. It says it's in the heart of the earth. It's in the heart of the earth. It said the earth was created in six days by, by God speaking it. Then God spoke it in six days. Lucian believed everything you guys believe in this room. He believed the Bible should be accepted literally. He magnified scripture. He mistrusted philosophy. He was also known. He was a sarcastic guy, very sarcastic. Uh, and he was the, 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 his sarcasm led him to be the guy who is now known as the world's first science fiction writer. And the reason he was a science fiction writer is he would write allegorically about the philosophers and mock them. Uh, he wrote this book called The True History, which was anything but a true history. But you knew it. If you read it, you know it wasn't true. And here's what he writes about. He writes about these, these guys are in the Atlantic uh, and they're in a ship and they're caught up in a cyclone to the moon. And, and uh, while they're on the moon, there's a war going on between the moon men and the sun people. Uh, and there's guys uh, riding in to uh, battle on uh, uh, fleas three times bigger than an elephant. Uh, they have uh, gar lickers and wind runners. And apparently there's United Nations because they're, it ends up in a truce. But, but you, know, you know how like we, like we would mock an evolutionist? Well, that's what he did. And here's what he said in his, in his foreword to the true history. He said, so, so dear reader, don't believe any of it. You say about his book, not just his book, but this slop they're putting out too. So this guy believed everything that you guys believe. If there was a Bible today and a Lucian today, and your pastor had to have one of them, had to have one of them preach, I'm going to tell you, he would have, he would have Lucian in this book. of the manuscripts that come out of Antioch. We know them as the Texas Receptus. You can call it the Byzantine text. You can call it the Rites text. Uh, you can call it the traditional text. You can call it the Antiochian text. You call it the original text if you want, okay? But we make much about the manuscripts that come out of Antioch, right? But there's something else that comes out of Antioch. There is an Antiochian mentality. Just as surely... Just as surely as there is an Alexandrian mentality, there is an Antiochian mentality. And here's the amazing thing about the Antiochian mentality. If, if, this were, um, if this were up here, if every one of the words in this sentence were written on a piece of wood, okay, if this was like this, And each word was on an individual piece of wood. And we used it to spell out the, the um, Alexandrian mentality. The Alexandrian mentality is the Bible is not perfect and can be improved on. Correct? That's the Alexandrian mentality, correct? Okay. If those were, if that sentence was made up of, of a piece of wood for every word, and the pieces of wood were, were put in that order, you have the Alexandrian mentality. But you could take the same words and just shuffle them around, and you come up with the Antiochian mentality. The Bible is perfect and can not be improved on. Same words, isn't it? Just arranged in a different manner. Isn't that what you believe? Don't you basically believe this? That book is perfect and can't be improved on. Then you have the Antiochian mentality. If you believe the Bible is not perfect and can be improved on, 
then you have the Alexandrian mentality. Now, here's the problem. You have two here, right? Right? Just say right. Just agree with me, okay? You're safe. If you can't agree, nod your head. I'll hear something. You have two here and you have two here. Then you don't have two results. You have a possible four results, correct? This is a true Alexandrian. Doesn't believe the Bible's perfect, uses a modern translation. This is a true Bible believer. Believes the Bible's perfect, cannot be improved on, does it, and uses the King James Bible. But can't you have this guy? Can't you have a guy that believes the Bible is absolutely perfect and cannot be improved on? Is he correct there? And he's using an NIV. <laughs> you say, well, he's just, a, he's just a liar and a deceiver. No, he's something else. He's a new convert. Just got saved, guys. You know, most people, when they get saved, believe the Bible is the Word of God. They think the Bible is absolutely perfect. So what happens to them? Bible college. One of the charges, or one of the, one of the uh, claims, one of the claims I never make for our King James Bible. Don't you ever make it? Uh, you ever hear anybody say this? Well, that book's, bless God, that book's, that King James Bible is the Word of God because I was led to Christ by one. So What? What, you getting saved made it the Word of God? Come on. Then if you didn't get saved, it doesn't make it the Word of God? And I, I talked to this young guy one time, uh, and he believed this. He believed the Bible was absolutely perfect and cannot be improved on. Is that good? And he used a good news for modern man. And I said, I have never seen anybody say that about good. Why do you believe that? He goes, because I was led to Christ by one. Well, that doesn't make it the Word of God, right? You say, well, what's going to happen to this guy? It depends on where he goes to Bible college. Because if this guy goes to one of these Bible colleges, they'll get rid of this. And he'll come out like this. And if he goes to a, a Bible believing Bible college, they'll get rid of that. And he'll come out like that. This guy's no threat to you. He's a new convert. This is the guy that's the threat. This guy uses only the old KJV. Beware of people that always just go, I believe, I love that old KJV. I love it. The good Lord gave us the KJV, and I wouldn't use none of them modern perversions. You say, now wait a minute. Isn't that the right thing to say? And then you're talking to him after church, and you go, man, preacher, I'm telling you, it's so good to be here. He says, you know, I mean, I, I was showing somebody the other day about Easter, how it's the right, and he goes, well, now, brother, I mean, we're, we're Bible believers, we're not Ruckmanites. <laughs> I mean, we're not fanatics, you know. I mean, Easter is a mistranslation. It should be Passover. And you go, whoa, whoa, whoa. You mean that's what Bible believers believe? You know what the problem is? He's got the right book. But he's got the wrong mentality. He's got the Alexandrian mentality. Guys, don't, don't get excited about a guy just because he's got a King James Bible. Uh, there are a few people, I was talking with the preachers, there are a few people in this world, if I could get them, they're King James guys, if I could get them, they sell my books to defend the King James Bible. If I could get them used in an NIV today, I would do it. You know why? Because they believe some screwy thing. And then they, they write a book and you take their book because they, well, they believe the King James Bible. And then they either change the book. Uh, uh, you know, this was a guy, I, I don't say anything against him, uh, Oliver B. Green. Oliver B. Green. You know, we're in trouble when the greatest radio preachers are dead and they're still preaching. I heard this, I heard him say this one time. I said, he said, pray for me today. I'm not feeling very good. I thought, we've been dead for eight years. <laughs> he said, I got a letter from a lady the other day. And I thought, 10 years after he's dead, his, his, his headstone must look like a, a mailbox. I'm never criticizing the, the post office again. They got him a letter 10, 10 years after he's dead. Oliver B. Green was a King James Bible believer, right? Yes, he was. Get an Oliver B. Green commentary. And he'll say, the Greek word here should have been translated this way. Say, had the right book? Sure did. Had the wrong mentality. This is the guy that will hurt you. Because he's, he's bashing his pulpit. Oh, only that book. Only that King James. Don't get me wrong when I say this. Don't be too impressed with what we say behind the pulpit. Watch what we do 
outside the pulpit. I had a, a, a young student, he got up and preached in his home church, a King James, I give you the pastor's name, you, you've heard the name, famous for talking about the King James Bible. Uh, and, um, and this guy uh, preached in his pastor's church, the home church, uh, about the King James Bible. And the pastor goes, that's good, brother, that's, that sure is good. Of course, we do know that 1 John 5, 7 doesn't belong in the Bible. Uh, no, we don't. You say, well, what was the problem? The problem is, see, you think because he's got the right book, he's okay. But if he doesn't have the right mentality, he's not okay. Now, let me just um, let me just talk to you about why did God, why did God choose this place right here, Antioch? Why did he choose that? Well, let's look at the choices he had. He could have chosen Jerusalem. Actually, he did once, right? But if the New Testament church had been had been founded in Jerusalem, you know what happened? It would have ever been enslaved to Judaism. Didn't they try that? In fact, take a look. Look at chapter 15. Acts chapter 15, verse 1. And certain men which came down from Judea uh, taught the brethren and said, except you be circumcised after the man manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. Guys, is that true? No. Now, wh what is said in the verse that it happened, that's true. But no, you don't have to be circumcised according to the law of Moses to be saved. So here's what happens. These guys come from Jerusalem. They go to Antioch, and they try to get power over them. And you know who goes back down south? Barnabas and Saul. But they're not taking turkeys this time. They're talking to them. And they go down to Jerusalem and say, what are you guys doing? Who do you think you are coming up to our church and telling our people? And so they meet. And, and um, basically the church in, in uh, Jerusalem, uh, they lay down four parameters. Uh, and they said this. Look at verse 19. Wherefore my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are, are turned to God, but that we write unto them that they, number one, abstain from pollution of idols. Well, that sounds like a good deal. And from fornication. Okay. And from things strangled and from blood. He said, let's tell those Gentiles that if they, if they just do these four, they're doing pretty good. And, now, now here's the problem. Um, if, if, um, I try to try to think of a, a, where, a, a way to say this. But if Paul and Barnabas go back to the church at Antioch and say, we went to Jerusalem and we got it straightened out and here's what they said. I'm telling you, somebody here is going to say, how do we know? How do we know you're telling us the truth? So the church in Jerusalem sent a couple of representatives. Look who they sent. Look at verse 28. Oh, look at verse, uh, 20, uh, uh, verse 26. Uh, men, uh, uh, verse 25, I'm sorry. Uh, it seemed good to, unto us, uh, being assembled with one accord, to send uh, chosen men unto you uh, with our beloved. Yeah, I'll bet. Beware of those people go, now beloved. I always take a step back when it goes, now beloved. Grab your wallet and your wife. Uh, we have sent uh, chosen men with you, uh, uh, unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Saul, men who have hazarded their lives in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have sent, therefore, Judas and Silas. That's who these guys are. Who, who shall also tell you the same things by mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. One, here they are, that you abstain from meats offered to idols. Two, and from blood. Three, and from things strangled. Four, and from fornication. So that's the only four. From which, if ye you keep yourselves, ye shall do well. Fare ye well. So when they were dismissed, they came to Antioch. Uh, when they were gathered, the multitude had gathered the multitude together. They delivered the epistle, which when they had read, they rejoiced for the consolation. So now you got this church business meeting in Antioch. Paul, Barnabas, get up and go, guys, we went down there. It's all taken care of. And we got two guys from that church in Jerusalem. They'll tell you the same thing. So after Paul and Barnabas get done, Look at verse 32. And Judas and Silas, being prophets also themselves, exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. After they had tarried there a space. Notice they didn't leave right away. They, they hung around. They were let go uh, in peace from the brethren unto the apostles. So here's what happens. Judas and Barnabas, uh, Judas, I'm sorry, Judas and Silas get up and they go, guys, look, I, we come as representatives of the, of the first Baptist church of Jerusalem. And we want to tell you we're sorry about those guys who came up here and told us they had to be circumcised. 
You do not have to be circumcised. What Paul and Barnabas have told you is right, and we're sorry for the inconvenience. Now the meeting is done, issue resolved, correct? And they said, uh, they hang around for a while, and, and here's Barnabas and Saul. They, they see Judas and Silas one day and go, you guys really helped us. Man, thanks a lot. And, and uh, look, when you go back down to Jerusalem, tell them we appreciate it, and, and you're free to go. We won't need you anymore. But they hung around for a while. And, and then they, it's time to leave. And I've often, here's what I've often pictured. Now, here's how I, I deal. I see, you ever, you ever, you guys spend a lot, a lot of time in motels. The, you're, it's the last day there. Your suitcase is open on the bed, and you're putting things in. Me, usually from across the room. But um, I can see these guys. They got their, their suitcases out. They're heading back to Jerusalem. And Judas gone, I am telling you, I am so glad we're getting out of here. I don't like Gentiles. I don't, I, it's a shame they can get saved. I don't like them. I even think they smell funny. Silas, you're not packing your bag. And Silas says, did you hear the way they sing? I, I remember we used to sing that way in our church before we got the screens. Silas, use your head. The apostles are getting old, bud. Somebody's going to have to replace them. Do you understand what this is? What a feather, a cap? You and I are the only ones who came up here and straightened these miserable Gentiles out. Now pack your bags, man, and let's get going. Did you hear him preach? Man, I remember we used to have meetings like that. Remember before they closed off the back half of the auditorium? I remember we used to have people going down the aisle and crying. It's like our old church used to be. Silas, I'm going to tell you something, bud. We have a bright future in Jerusalem. Now, if you want to stay here, you stay here. But I'll tell you, you'll never be heard from again. I'm going back to the, where it's really happening. And Judas went back to Jerusalem and was never heard from again. And Silas stayed here and ended up Paul's partner in the gospel. You know, when I was uh, first saved in 1970, we'd be doing some door knocking. We'd run into some old Methodists that were saved. Now, right down the street from the church I was saved was a, was a Methodist church. And it was apostate. It was apostate in 1970. And, and I'd say, uh, why are you staying in that church? That church doesn't believe what you believe anymore. It doesn't, doesn't preach the gospel, does it? No. They don't sing like they used to? No. They don't preach like they used to? No. Why are you staying? Well, man, I helped build that church. That doesn't mean a thing. Get out of Dodge, pal, and go where there's some life. Here's the sad thing. That was 1970. Today, you can knock on the doors of the people that were going to the church I got saved in that now has two screens and the drum set and the contemporary slop, and there's people in that congregation don't buy it at all. You say, why don't you get out? Well, I, I built this building. Get out of Dodge, pal. Go find where God is and be there. Amen. So why did God choose Antioch? Uh, Antioch is like Houston, Texas. Antioch, my son, our, our son Nathan is a pastor in Lewiston, Idaho, 200 miles from the Pacific, and it's an ocean port. It is the last port on the Columbia River. Houston, Texas, 50 miles from the Gulf of Mexico, it is an ocean port. Antioch was on the Arantas River, and it was on the trade routes. Anybody going from, from Europe to Asia, or from Asia to Europe. Any place you're going to go, you're going to go through Antioch. You know what God did? It, it was like, I always say it this way. When God chose Antioch, he put the go in gospel. <laughs> because I, I believe, I personally believe probably some of the originals were written here. And from here the gospel went, in fact, that's where it went into Europe from. Is that not true? Um, he didn't choose Jerusalem because Jerusalem would have lorded over him. Okay, guys, um, he could have picked Alexandria. You think he's going to pick Alexandria? I don't think he's going to pick. How about Rome? Well, there are some people who think he picked Rome. How about Athens? The only thing we know about Athens, you know what it says in Acts chapter 17? They all like football. Oh, I'm sorry. It says they were totally given to idolatry. Kind of the same thing, okay? So he picked the only city that would take the gospel around the world. Now, I am done, but I'm not done. Because we have to look at the wisest man that ever lived. You said you are not as wise as Solomon. You are not wiser than Solomon, correct? 
Correct? Okay, I want you to go to two places in your Bible. We're gonna, now, we're going to go to two places, and we'll get this over with, and then we'll go, ee. But, but here's what I've got to tell you. I've got to warn you. We're going to go to Deuteronomy 17, and we're going to go to 1 Kings chapter 10. And when I say leave Deuteronomy, go to 1 Kings, we're coming back to Deuteronomy. When I say go back to Deuteronomy, we're coming back to Kings. So, so don't close your Bible. Keep, keep a marker in both of those places. And I was, I was talking with uh, some of the brethren here the, the other day. Uh, let me ask you people a question. Do you know what tear gas is? you know what it does? Does everybody here know what tear gas does? Okay. Knowing that, if somebody threw a canister of tear gas in here, would you say, well, I know what it does, so it doesn't affect me? It still affects you, right? Do you know what vertigo is? Vertigo is you're flying and you fly into a cloud and you literally are to you become totally disoriented. You, you literally don't know. You, you could be going in a turn and think you're flying level. You don't know which ends up. You actually, when you go vertigo, you become a Democrat. You don't know which ends up. I, I, you know, the, and the standard thing they tell pilots is spit. They tell them to spit. You know why? How could you imagine thinking I'm, I'm flying straight and level and you go, and it goes, it goes, uh-oh. <laughs> and this guy, he was so scared that he spit so hard, he hit the windshield and goes, I'm in a dive! <laughs> oh, well. Anyway, well, the reason I'm saying that is because <coughs> there are spirits in our country that I talk to you about, and because you know about them doesn't mean that you're, you're exempt from them or insulated from them or inoculated from them. And so I want you to know that if somebody else can't get away with something just because you know about it, that doesn't mean you can go get away with it either. Now let's take a look at the wisest man that ever lived in Deuteronomy chapter 17. And here's what it says in verse 16. But, when he, uh, but he shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt, to the end that he should multiply horses for as much as the Lord has said unto you, ye shall henceforth return no more that way. All right. So even though this wasn't directed at Solomon by name, didn't he become the king of Egypt, uh, Israel? So it is written to him, right? So Solomon, in that verse, was told, don't go to Egypt for a horse, correct? Keep your place there. Go to Deuteronomy. I'm sorry, go to 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 28. And Solomon had horses brought out of Egypt. Uh, do we have a problem here? And linen yarn, the king's merchants, received the linen yarn at a price. Uh, and, a, and a chariot came up and went out of Egypt for 600 shekels of silver and a horse for 150. And so, they all, uh, and so for all the kings of the Hittites and for the kings of Syria did they bring them out by their means. Hey, guys, Solomon indeed was a used car dealer. He was a used chariot dealer. And he had horses and chariots brought out of Egypt and brought to Jerusalem to be, to be sold. Now, could you imagine a Bible believer? Remember what I told you? You become a problem to your pastor when you are more spiritual than him or you think you are. Knock on Solomon's door. Can I help you? Uh, yes, King. Um, you know, I'm just a nobody. Uh, I work down at the docks. But uh, I, I noticed they were unloading horses from one of the ships and, that, and they were Egyptian horses. Oh, and you want a good deal on the horse, don't you? Well, no, actually, that's, that's not what I meant. Um, you, you know, the Bible said that when you have a king, he shouldn't go to Egypt for horses. Are you wiser than me? Oh, oh no, 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 no. Uh, the Bible says I shouldn't go to Egypt for horses, right? Well, yes, it does. Did I go to Egypt for horses? Yes, you did. Does it look like it hurt me? Well, well no but you still violated the scripture. Get out of here. Yes, sir. Keep your place there. Go to Deuteronomy. Verse 17. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself that his heart turned not away. Neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. Solomon was told not to multiply silver to himself. Look at um, verse 27. 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 27. And the king made silver to be in Jerusalem as stones. 
Oh, it's you again uh, about the horses, huh? Horses still bothering you? Well, well, no, sir. Uh, no, the horses, uh, they're not. They're not. So, uh, so what's the problem? You get a horse? <laughs> no, I didn't get a horse. What's the problem? Silver. It, it's the silver. Have you noticed? I got so much silver. Think about this, guys. You got at this nice asphalt parking lot out here. What if you had a gravel parking lot and all the gravel was silver ore? Solid silver nuggets. Now, here's what you're thinking. People would steal it. Not if every gravel parking lot in the city was silver ore. Right? He said, man, did you? I brought so much silver in. We're paving our parking lots with it. Yes, yes, you are. It shows our wealth. It shows how God has blessed us. Well, yeah, well, maybe it does. But you know, um, you know there in Deuteronomy where it said you shouldn't go to Egypt for horses? Oh, yeah, you told me about that. Wait, well, right there it also said you shouldn't go and, and multiply silver. I think we established this, right? You're, you're not wiser than me, right? Oh, no, no. Did God choose you to be king or me? Oh, oh he chose you. Then get out of here. I mean, I violated scripture. You're telling me. Has it hurt me? Well, I, I can't see what's hurt you. Get out of here. Didn't it say back there he should not multiply gold to himself, right? Look at chapter 10, verse uh, 16. And Solomon made 200 targets of beaten gold. 600 shekels of gold went to one target. And he made 300 shields of beaten gold. Three pounds of gold went to one shield. 18. Moreover, the king made a great throne of ivory and overlaid it with the best gold. 21. And all King Solomon's drinking vessels were of gold. 22. For the king had at sea a navy of Tharshish with the navy of Hiram. Uh, once in three years came the navy of Tharshish bringing gold. Verse 25. And he brought every man his present, vessels of silver and vessels of gold. Oh, I'm a little Bible scholar. It's the horses. Silver still bothering you? Gold. Oh, man, have you seen all the gold I've got? Man, we have, we're bringing it in all the time. Yeah, I know, I know, you know, but the Bible says that uh, you're not supposed to... Hey, 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 hey. Do you know how much gold I got just this year? Look at verse 14, people. In one year. Solomon got 666 talents of gold. Do you know what it is reported that Solomon said when he found out he got 666 talents of gold in one year? You know what he said after that? Man, am I glad Revelation hasn't been written yet. Because it didn't mean anything to him. Did, did it catch your eye? Kid, kid, I've gotten 666 talents of gold just this year. I, I know old king, and for some reason, even that number doesn't sit well with me. Are you wiser than me? No, sir. Did God choose you to be king? No, sir. Do you want to be king? No, sir. Then touch not God's anointed. Don't you ever come back again. Didn't he tell him he shouldn't multiply wives to himself? Look at 1 Kings 11. But King Solomon loved many strange women. How come I can visualize these strange women? I can see their hair standing straight up, pink, orange, rings in their ears and their noses and their lips and, and everything. But wait a second. But King Solomon loved many strange women together with the daughter of who? Pharaoh's king of where? Okay, can I give you some more gift logic? The used car dealer that you wouldn't buy a car from? Would you marry his daughter? This guy went to Egypt. You shouldn't go there for a horse. Why would you marry his daughter? And you certainly shouldn't go there for a Bible. Together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites, of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their God. Solomon, clave unto these. There's the two words, lady, in love. Well, it's okay if we do this because we're in love. Um, I, I read that verse. I've had somebody say, well, it wasn't love, it was lust. Question, does the word lust appear in the Bible? 
then why didn't God put it in the verse? If it was lust, why didn't he put lust? Because it wasn't lust. He was in love and in love and in love. I I've often said that, that Solomon had a low threshold for love. He'd see somebody go, what? Wow, look at, look at her. Man, she's beautiful. I'm in love with her. I want to marry her. What? I already did. Three years ago. Are we happy? <laughs> I mean, Solomon was just quick to fall in love, and in love, and in love, and in love, and in love. <laughs> Beware. Being in love doesn't necessarily... Remember I told you the illustration there? about that man and woman in my office, I don't doubt they were in love. And I'm telling you, their love was not of God. And you young unmarried, I hate to say this, but you're going to fall in love, and then you're going to try to make that the will of God. And it may not be the will of God. And if it is not, get away from it. You will always be better. Look what happens. Um, verse 2. Well, let's see. The nations concerning the uh, which, yeah. Uh, the Lord said unto them, Ye shall not go into them, neither shall they come into you. Uh, for certainly they will turn, your, uh, turn away your heart uh, after their God. Solomon claimed unto these in love. For he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines. Oh, you know what I've always thought about when I read that verse? A thousand mothers-in-law. Guys, I don't, I don't know about your mother-in-law. My mother-in-law is famous. My mother-in-law is in a movie. She really was. She was in this one movie where a house fell on her sister. But um, I can't imagine. I think any guy that gets a thousand mother-in-laws gets what he deserves. <laughs> but remember what the Bible says? Solomon was the wisest man that ever lived, right? That verse proves it. What did he call his wives? Princesses. Nobody can remember a thousand women. You can't remember a thousand women's names. Could you see him? You guys that can't remember your anniversary... You, one day a year, you can't remember your anniversary. You know what Solomon knew? I got about three per day. All I got to do is find out who they're for. <laughs> Look, I got a gift for our anniversary, Mary. <laughs> Betty, Betty. No, no, I said I was glad that we got married, Betty. Oh, and it's next week. Yes, that's right. I knew that. I just wanted you to see it. Oh, man, whose anniversary is it? You know what he would do? Hey, could you imagine this guy walking in with one of his thousand wives? And somebody says, and who is this? Dorothy uh, told me about Sarah here, who I love dearly. You know what he said? This is my princess. Come on, princess. <laughs> Guys, very wise. No bruises. Look what it says, verse 3. And he had 700 wives, princesses, 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. Now watch very carefully verse 4. <coughs> For it came to pass when Solomon was old, that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. Uh, I'm going I'm to be very, very canted, very, very frank, and I'm going to talk about Brad, Brad, Brad Brandy. Brad is uh, 37. Our oldest son is 38. I was devastated to find out you're young enough to be my kid. Um, Brad, more than most pastors of his age, are very much involved in the battles for the Lord. Uh, he he battles uh, the the, uh, the political left. Uh, he battles the homosexuals in his town and in his state uh, more than others. He is very much hated. Now, now here is what I tell young men: young men, you need to get what I call stupid convictions. You need to believe that Jesus Christ, Son of God, that's not a stupid conviction. That salvation is by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that's not a stupid conviction. The King James Bible, the Word of God, that's not a stupid conviction. Then you need to have some stupid ones. You say, why? Well, you need to believe something like, um, I, I'll give you an example. I had this pastor one time. I'm preaching, I'm preaching with him. Uh, and he said, when I got saved, I heard that the devil was a bull. Therefore, I figured that cowboy boots are of the devil. And we have two of them right here. Now, and he preached it. But you know what he's doing when he's telling me this? He's wearing cowboy boots. He's wearing cowboy boots, telling me when I was young in the Lord, I thought cowboy boots were the devil. You say, well, what happened? That was a stupid conviction. And here's what happens. Over years, you get tired of fighting. You get tired of fighting. 
Your pastor has fought for years. Brother Cullen has fought for years. I have fought for years. Uh, I get tired. You, you know what you get tired? You get tired of people who don't even know you hate your guts. My goodness, you have no, well, maybe you do. I don't have an idea. Or I have only an idea of what they say about me on the Internet and other places. Lie, and you just get tired of it. And, and here's what guys do. I've heard them say this. Well, I'm taking Baptists off the name of our church because I'm tired of fighting over Baptists. And I tell them, no, you're not. You're not tired of fighting over Baptists. You're tired of fighting. Right. You know how I know? Because you're going to take Baptists off the name and still fight over the King James Bible and music and dress standards. And you go, well, I'm tired of fighting over the Bible and music and dress standards. No, you're just tired of fighting. Do you know what our military does? We can have a line company in, ball, in, 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 in mortal combat, engaged in mortal combat with an enemy unit. And before that battle's over, when it is still questionable, one of our guys will be facing the enemy, shooting at him, and an American soldier will walk up, tap him on the shoulder and say, uh, uh, I'm from Company uh, Charlie, and you're Able Company, and you guys are being pulled back. Uh, you're taking two weeks off. We'll finish this battle for you. You know what they do? They take a couple weeks off. You get tired of fighting. Some of you get tired of fighting. Don't change your convictions. Go away for a while. Don't go away and smoke and drink and everything else. When my wife and I go, you know, we get people, they say this. They go, hey, when you get some time off, come by and see us. I said, when we get time off, I don't want to see you. That's why they call it time off. I said, think about it, pal. They got to pay me to come and see you. But here's the thing, guys. We are always on, always. You don't do this. I do. Whenever, we step out, whenever I step out of, my front, uh, out of my front door, the only door we have, when my foot hits the ground, I am on somebody else's property. Whether I'm parked here, campground, church, ever. I don't have a piece of ground. I would love to step out, walk 360 degrees around where I'm staying, and be on my property. So what happens is you get tired of fighting. And we just go away and we just watch grass grow. We don't do anything. Uh, could, you, could you church members remember this for the sake of your pastor? If he goes to a conference like this one, when he comes back, don't say, Pastor, how was your vacation? I hope when Brother Brandon goes back next week, his people will go, Pastor, how was your vacation? Listen, if you paint houses, do you go to Florida? I went to Miami. What would you do? I painted three houses. How was your vacation? Right? You go and do nothing. And so, so here's what you need some stupid convictions because as you grow older, you shed convictions. So you need some stupid ones to lose. By the way, the guy that thought that cowboy boots was of the devil when he was a young man, you know what else he thought? He thought the King James Bible was the Word of God. Now he no longer thinks it's a sin to wear cowboy boots. And he still believes the King James Bible is the Word of God because he had some to shed. Right. Brother Brandon, again, I, and I'm saying this because I love you, brother. He is in a battle. And if the Lord tarries, he is going to get so tired of fighting because we all get tired of fighting. Guys, I cannot, I, I, I had this, uh, we had this meeting one time when I was a youth director, and I'm always the guy that goes in. I am the guy that is going to stand up and take the punch. And there was another, we were going to meet with these people about sex education in public schools, and there was another youth director who was a real spark plug. His name was Randy, and I said, oh, I said, for once, I am glad that somebody else is going to be the lead man. Randy will get up. They'll hate him. Now, I'm telling you, I will stand up behind him. I will back him. I really will. But I just get tired of always being the one that everybody hates. And so I get here, all these youth directors, and I go, well, where's Randy? They say, oh, something happened. He couldn't be here. I said, oh. And so they get this, I can still remember this doctor and this red-haired nurse. Hmm. And, and they start on sex education, and my hand shut up. And I'm telling you guys, that red hair got redder. <laughs> and I, I disputed with them. And... If while I was talking, I had a heart attack, that doctor nurse would have went over and said, uh, that looks pretty bad. You, you know anything about CPR? Well, I'm, you know, I'm kind of rusty. I, do you know anything? No. But, you know, he's a goner. <laughs> I'm sorry. You get tired of being hated. Some of you are tired of being hated by your families or being ostracized. Then lose your stupid convictions. But don't go back on the Lord and don't go back on the book. And here was Solomon. See, he knew those gods were false gods, and it never affected him until he got old. And when he got old, he said, I'm so tired of it. And they said, well, then why don't you come to my church? They don't bury their nose in a hymnal, and they sing just like choruses. 
And the sermon is, is how to be a successful king. It's all horizontal. It's all about you. Verse 4, It came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. And, and Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and went not fully after the Lord as did David his father. Then did Solomon build a high place for Chemish, the uh, abomination of Moab, in the hill that is before Jerusalem and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. And likewise he did for all his strange wives, which burn incense and sacrificed unto their gods. The Bible told Solomon, don't go to Egypt for horses. Did he go? And did it hurt him? Uh, did the Bible tell Solomon, don't multiply silver? And he did it, right? Did it hurt him? Multiply gold, don't multiply gold. Did it hurt him? Actually, he couldn't see it, but it hurt him every time. And it said, don't multiply wives. And it hurt him. Now, I want you to go back to Deuteronomy. I'm done, but I, you've got to see this. You saw what Solomon was told not to do. And he did every one of them, correct? I'm going to show you what Solomon was told to do. I don't believe he did it. Deuteronomy chapter 17. Verse um, 18. And it shall be, when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom, that it shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests, the Levites. You understand there were no printing presses. You didn't go to the Bible bookstore to get a book, uh, to, to get a Bible. And the Levites were in charge of keeping the Scripture. And he said, when, a king, when you get a king on the throne, you know what he wanted to do? He needs to get a copy of the Bible. But I don't want him to tell some scribe, copy the Bible for me. Tell him to do it himself. Well, you know, if you wrote, if the only way you had a copy of your Bible was you hand wrote it yourself from the one in your lap, I'll bet that book might just mean a little more to you. But what is he told to do with this? Well, he's told to put it on the coffee table and smash the first rose from the date he ever had. First date he ever had. No. Look what it says, verse 19. And there's a, there's a, there's, in the next two verses, there's a five-point sermon here. And it shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life. Is he just, did this guy just, was he just told to read the Bible every day? By the way, isn't this chapter written to a guy that's going to be king who isn't even a king yet? So you got a chapter in the Bible that, that talks to somebody who is going to be a king someday who is not a king right now, and they're told to read the Bible every day. You know what I'm doing right now? I'm talking to a bunch of people who are going to be kings someday, but you aren't yet. Maybe you should heed your Bible and read it every day. Why? Five reasons. One, they may learn to fear the Lord's God. If you read that book every day, you would be afraid of the God that wrote that book. Two, to keep all the words of this law and these statutes and to do them. Three, that his heart be not lifted up above his brethren. I find his heart was lifted up appear three times in the Bible. Maybe it happened four. Uh, it happened to Uriah, or, or, or uh, Uzziah, the king. When God was blessing him, said his heart was lifted up, and he thought he could go in a temple and make an offering, ended up a leper. Hezekiah, when, when God healed him, his heart was lifted up, and he opened up his treasuries to the, the kings of Babylon and ended up getting all of Jerusalem con condemned. And in Ezekiel chapter 28, most beautiful being ever created to that time, was a guy named Lucifer, and it said his heart was lifted up because of his beauty. I am not a believer that when things are going good, things are going to go bad, but when God blesses you, don't ever, just be careful. When you start going, you see what God did for me? That's when you feel that. And if you'll read that book and read that book, your heart won't be lifted up. Four, and that he turn not aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left. I, I believe that the left, is very, very bad. They're socialists, they're communists. I, I'm not a leftist. But you know what we do? We say, well, that left is bad. Then I need to be on the right. No, he said, don't go over there. Let me tell you what happens in churches. I, I saw this happen in a church. Your pastor knows the church. It was a very good Bible-believing church, and the pastor turned left into the contemporary movement. And that was wrong. That is exactly what Paul prophesied in Acts chapter 20 when he said, there will be grievous wolves come into the flock. And then it said, and then there will be men from within, not sparing the flock. And here's what happened. 
when this pastor made a left turn, there were men in the flock that said, that is wrong, and turned right. And now they're all dressed like Amish people. Gone to the left is wrong, and gone to the right is wrong. And you stay in that book, and it'll keep you from being too far on the left. You gotta have some compassion. Left to say they have some compassion. You need to have some compassion. Uh, you have to have some good sense. Com conservatives, right, they have some common sense, right? But look at the fifth one. To the end that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and, what's the next two words? His children in the midst of Israel. You want a challenge? I'm going to give you a challenge. Find the genealogical record of Solomon. Okay, think about this. He had a thousand wives, right? If one was barren, don't you reckon one might have had twins or one might have had more than one kid? Am I being, am I, am I, Reaching too far if I say he should have had at least a thousand? But if not, he should have at least nine hundred. Okay? Where are they? Don't you think Solomon could have had third chronicles all to himself? Where'd they go? You remember who he built an altar to? Moloch. Do you know how you worship Moloch? You take your newborn baby. Moloch was a great can you ever see those go to a Chinese restaurant and see a big smiling Buddha? Moloch was like that. He, had, he sat cross-legged and right in his lap was a fire. And you took your newborn baby to worship this God and threw it in the fire. I think Solomon ended his own posterity because he didn't follow that book. He, didn't, he, didn't do, he did what he was told not to do, but he didn't do what he was told to do. You say, preacher, why are you telling this? I'm telling you this about somebody that you admitted is smarter than you right? Then, then if this guy who is so smart can violate Scripture and not get away with it, where do you think you're going to violate it and get away with it? Where do you think you're going to go? Well, I know the difference, and so it's okay if I read an NIV just to clarify what the King James says. Where do you think you're going to get away with what somebody smarter than you can get away with? Where do you think you're going you're to get through this country now the way it is in the 21st century and not read your Bible? Man, if any time we needed to read the Bible, now's the time we, read, we need to read that book. Don't you want to be a king someday? Well, the guy that was there who wasn't a king yet was told to read that book every day. Guys, you need to read that book every day. It will protect you five ways. It will protect you. Guys, I am done. I'm sorry for taking so long. I didn't expect to go uh, three hours, but um, this is the long one. We'll give, you, we'll give you a break tomorrow. We'll give you food now. All right, let's have a word of prayer. God, I pray for these people. I pray for the people in this room at this moment. They came here today, this morning. They put aside whatever they usually do on Tuesday morning to come and learn something about your Bible. I hope they did. But I hope they learned something about the God that wrote the Bible. I hope they learned something about you. I hope they learned something about themselves. Having the King James Bible and believing it, that is a wonderful thing and that is so correct. But it is not... It is not an inoculation that we can't make a bad decision, that we can't go apostate, that our heart cannot be lifted up, that we cannot violate the very scripture that we say we believe. God, protect these people from themselves, please. I don't want them to be scared to death that the next second they're going to make a wrong decision. They don't need that. But the Bible says they need to walk circumspectly. They need to look at their past. They need to judge their own motives as critically as they judge the motives of others. And they need desperately to be in your Bible. Help them to be Bible readers as well as Bible believers. To your glory, in Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. Brother Tom, anything?